just in case. 2 a.m. <laughs> Good evening and, and welcome to the Monday, September 10th, 19, I'm sorry, 2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. <clears throat> May we please pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Councillor Caitlin Jordan will be late this evening. May we please have the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councillor Garvin? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Lennon? Councillor Randall? Here. And Councillor Straw? Here. Great, thank you. Um, and now, town council reports and any correspondence. Do we have any reports or correspondence? Councilor Straw? Uh, so, uh, as you know, I'm the liaison to the MMA, the Maine Municipal Association's uh, LPC Legislative Policy uh, Committee. And uh, on 20, August 22nd, the MMA LPC held its biennium legislative agenda meeting. And basically, it's when the various entities or the representatives in the MMA get together and decide what they're going to advocate. Uh, in Augusta on behalf of the towns, uh, what issues they're gonna prioritize. So there was a list of maybe 10, 20 different items that came up. Um, and uh, I advocated basically for the various issues that have been facing the town and the things that we've expressed as being our priorities, um, such as the school funding formula, um, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the issues that ended up coming out at that meeting, which I was oblivious to, but the rest of you may be very well aware of, is that there's something called uh, local revenue sharing. So basically, uh, when the state takes in income tax and sales tax, I believe, revenue at the state level, they redistribute it to the towns. Um, so one of the major items, if not the major item, that seemed like there was unanimous consensus for that they really want to focus on is trying to... Re so, oh, sorry, take a step back. So a few years ago, Augusta slashed this, the local revenue sharing. So we were supposed to be getting 5%. They cut it back to 2%. And when they did that, they said, we're going to cut it back to 2%, but we'll restore it all in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so when they cut that back, that over the last five years has taken $2.8 million from Cape Elizabeth. So we're arguing about school budget and a little bit, little, various other things involving money, but we lost $2.8 million. And this was eye-opening to me. I had no idea this was going on. So anyway, the number one thing that the MMA group really wanted to push forward is trying to ensure that in 2020, when the revenue sharing is supposed to switch back to 5%, and using last year's numbers, we'd see an immediate increase in $570,000 coming from Augusta. There's great concern that when 2020 hits, the legislature is going to say, hmm, yeah, we kind of like keeping this money, and they're not going to allow it to go back up to 5%. So that was the number one item that they were going to tackle, and that's the number one thing they're focused on. So that's the report. I can tell you about the other items that came up if anyone's curious. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Chris? Anything else? Councilor Garvin? Um, I just wanted to uh, make folks aware of an event coming up uh, at Eco Maine uh, on Saturday, uh, September 29th. We're a member owner community of Eco Maine, and you've heard both myself and Matt speaking recently about um, you know the town's efforts to do a better job of um, educating everybody about uh, recycling contamination and some of the associated issues over at Eco Maine as a result of that. Um, they have their annual open house on Saturday, the 29th at 8 o'clock. It's a family friendly event with lots of activities, tour the, tours of the facility, um, a lot of demonstrations going on. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, ways to improve recycling and sustainability in your own life, then welcome you to come check it out. Right, thank you. And uh, Councillor Penny Jordan. Um, I just wanted to uh, let people know that 
um, one of the first drafts of the comprehensive plan uh, should be out on the uh, town's website. And to ask people, uh, and I'll be saying this again in October, but uh, there is going to be a public forum on October 30th. It'll be uh, um, kind of the wrap up of drafting the plan, but you will hear much more after that. But it would be great to have a good turnout as we uh, put the finishing touches on this draft and get as much uh, public input as we can. All right, thank you. And I received a card from a citizen, Colette Howe, who called with questions concerning a potential town charter amendment. I forwarded her to the town clerk, but I'm giving the clerk this card for the public record. So there you go. Okay, moving on. The Finance Committee report, please. I'll turn that over to Council Garvin. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief this month. Um, we're two months into the fiscal year that began July 1. Um, you all received the dashboard this afternoon uh, and have it in the packet, um, in talking to Matt, um, you know, n no really significant uh, updates, um, you know, departures from forecast or uh, any uh, sort of anomalies to point out. Um, so there's also the associated other uh, reports on uh, the account ledgers. If anybody has any questions, by all means. But otherwise, that's the report from the Finance Committee. You know, I've, I've got a thought yep. um, in consideration of, of what Council Straw just reported about revenue sharing. Of course, we have been, with, that's been decreasing for years. I mean, we hear much more actually about it from the school department during our school budget deliberations, but we, the town, has been losing revenue sharing as have all, pretty much all municipalities in Maine. We have uh, made uh, points of mentioning that on our dashboard regarding the school department, perhaps we should include uh, the loss of revenue sharing on the municipal side on our dashboard as well. Just a thought. Anyway, thank you. Um, any questions or comments for uh, Council Garvin? Okay. Anything else on the following? Appropriation controls, expense distributions, revenue or revenue distribution, nothing more on that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Now we come to the uh, opportunity for citizens to address the town council for items that are not on this evening's agenda. Is there anyone that would like to address the town council? We need your name and your address, please. Yeah, good evening. I'm Chris Munns and I live at 5 South Street. I'm a 15 year resident. I'm appearing before you this evening to ask one last time for your support for the town to install a gate on the public Astor Lane, or at least to support a return of our gate on our private South Street. Without the gate, my family has no choice but to leave our home and live somewhere else, and thus we are moving to another residence that provides a safer environment for my children, although we are keeping our South Street home. The absence of the gate has just made things too dangerous for our son, with his disability, and there are no, now both cars and trucks barreling down our one-lane South Street private road. What I'm asking the council to do is simple, just to adopt a resolution in support of the reinstallation of the gate. If that can happen, we will drop our appeal to the court of the planning board's permit requirement that the gate be removed. Our neighborhood residents on both the private South Street and Stevenson Street formed on August 31st a road maintenance association just for the purpose of installing the gate. I forwarded you last week a copy of the association's inaugural meeting and bylaws and its vote to reinstall the gate. The association is properly formed and voted upon according to the state statute on private road associations. We would like to return to our home, but we need the gate to be back in place. Please instruct your attorney to contact our attorney to settle our appeal, which we will do with the town council support of the road association and its vote to install the gate. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And for our counsel, for the audience here in the audience at home, we, Mr. Muntz has come before us, uh, I think this is the third occasion with this issue. Um, as we have said in our public comment session and also have, I've written to Mr. Muntz, we are, uh, he is legally appealing a decision of the planning board. This is an act of litigation. The town council will not be 
engaging in this, and we certainly recommend him to contact our attorney through his own attorney if he should choose. But for these reasons, uh, the town, and also the town council has no role in um, endorsing a neighborhood road association. So thank you, Mr. Munts, but you know, we have responded to you on this issue. Anyone else would like to speak to the town council? Thank you. We will need your name and address, and, and you have three minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Dan Glover. I uh, live in Westbrook, 90 Stroudwater Street, and I am a member of the Greater Portland Archangel Committee. Back in 1988, November of 88, Mayor Phil Spiller of Westbrook went to Archangel Russia and signed an agreement to make the Greater Portland region pair with the city of Archangel Russia as a sister city. Your chairman, Frank P. Latore, on behalf of Cape Elizabeth and other representatives of the region, countersigned the agreement in April of 18, 1989 the state of, in the state of Maine Room in Portland. We thank the Cape for its support and for, its, for the relationship and involvement in various exchanges over the years. And we have had many successful exchanges involving many parts of our communities including high school exchanges, uh, the State Department of Transportation, University of Southern Maine, judges and lawyers, and most recently local fire departments and state forestry agencies. Even though 88 seemed a difficult time for such a relationship to be established, it was the will of the greater Portland region to make the effort to engage the Russian peoples. Today, it seems no less a difficult time as we celebrate 30 years of partnership. Tonight, we want to make the people of Cape Elizabeth aware, and we ask you to participate in what we are calling the Bridges of Friendship Photography Exchange. An exhibit will be held at the Stonewall Gallery in Yarmouth, Maine, simultaneous to an exhibition to be held in Archangel, Russia during the same time frame. The patronage request reads in part, uh, as follows. The, in November, the, this November is the 30th anniversary of the sister city relationship between Greater Portland, Maine and Archangel Russia. There is a wonderful opportunity for the 14 communities in the Greater Portland area to support a photographic cultural exchange between the Portland Camera Club of Maine and the Spalaki Camera Club of Archangel Russia. <laughs> We are seeking $150 from each municipality to help bring 30 pair, that's 60 photographs, of images from both countries to be recognized by the Bridges of Friendship Photography Exhibition. This exhibit will provide a unique opportunity for the residents of Greater Portland to see a jury show of outstanding photographs from each country side by side, and we hope you will find this exhibit valuable to your community and worthy of your support. Uh, updates on the exchange can be found on the Camera Club, Camera, Portland Camera Club website at portlandcameraclub.org, and we will work through your chairman, Jessica Sullivan, to find out who we might communicate with further regarding this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm oh, sorry, these are two of the photographs. This one is called Bridge Over Bridge, so we're using that one to sort of headline the exchange. That really shows of the Royal River, which is in Yarmouth, which is where the site of the exchange would take place. So those are our two windows. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the town council on items that are not on this evening's agenda? Okay, moving forward, could we please have the town manager's monthly report? Thank you, Madam Chairman. In preparing for tonight's manager's report, I plan on being mindful of the items that are on this evening's agenda and the great amount of public interest for tonight's items. With that being said, I have a significant announcement to make regarding town staffing. After almost 40 years with the Cape Elizabeth Police Department and 18 years as our chief, Neil Williams will be retiring as chief of police effective December 31st, 2018. I'd like to take the opportunity to be the first to thank Chief Williams for his dedication to the town of Cape Elizabeth and its citizens and wish him only the best in his next phase of life. If you're in the Oakhurst section of town, you will notice that Oakhurst Road will be closed between the Portland Water District pumping station and Rockwall Lane. 
between 7.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. today through Wednesday. The closure will allow a segment of the sanitary sewer line to be replaced. At the August Council meeting, the Council placed the regional collaboration question on the November ballot. The background information had initially identified the school department would receive an estimated $72,700 in funding, but since that initial estimate, the Commissioner of Education has taken a revised interpretation of the subsidy and has applied an additional formula against the allocated funds, resulting in the school expecting to receive $22,100 instead. Superintendent Wolfram provided this update to me so I could share this with the council. And I provided you a letter this evening from the superintendent explaining this change. Discussions are ongoing with the Historical Society on the reuse of the Spurwing School as I've had three meetings with Jim Rowe and we have recently reviewed the facility. Last Friday I went through the building with local architect Joseph Shalat, who will be providing me with additional information as we explore renovation options with the building. Finally, I have some personnel announcements of a positive kind at Community Services to report. I'm happy to inform the Council that Kerry Curtis has joined our staff as Fort Williams Park Coordinator. Jane Anderson is on board as our new Senior Program Coordinator and Peter Mullen as our new Youth Program Coordinator. And we are very happy to report that we are welcoming Kathy Maxwell as our new Deputy <coughs> Clerk. Respectfully submitted, Town Manager Matthew Sturgis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, are there any questions or comments for Matt? Monthly report? Great, thank you. Council Straw? I just wanted to thank the Chief for all of his service to the town. I'm greatly appreciative of it. Thank you. I'm sure there will be more opportunities to thank Chief Williams for his service to our citizens. <clears throat> the next item is a review of the draft minutes of the August 13, 2018 uh, Town Council meeting. Is there a motion to approve the draft minutes? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, uh, any questions, any edits, comments? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Next item we have is a presentation by the town assessor Clinton Sweat concerning the proposed property tax relief program. Um, we're gonna be considering this a little later. We'll, the, the agenda item involves us <coughs> considering sending it on to the ordinance committee. So, um, but uh, Mr. Sweat's gonna give us a brief presentation of what that is all about. Super, thank you. Uh Thank you, Council, for, for having me here um, to speak on the Senior Tax Relief Program. Uh, this was one of the Council goals put forth in 2019, and uh, I'm happy to work with, uh, with Matt and, and some others on crafting this program. Um, the original presentation was presented back in April to the Council. Uh, it later went to a workshop in May where the uh, where later on the council uh, earmarked $75,000 in the 2019 budget uh, to fund the, uh, the relief program. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation tonight. I figured I'd keep things kind of fast and moving along so uh, uh, the counselors have the chart in their uh, packets. And for the audience, I've got a placard here that just kind of highlights some of the the, the high points of the program. And I'll quickly go over some of those. This program would be available to anyone 65 years of age or older, have owned their property for approximately 10 years or, or more, currently receiving the homestead exemption, and the, uh, the cap that we've put on the program is $60,000, so uh, the individual would have to have an income of less than that to qualify. Um, then we would take that income and uh, adjust it to a 5% cap 
and if the taxes are more than 5% of their uh, income, they would get a, uh, a refund for up to $500 should they qualify. Uh, and hopefully we can get, get this to the, uh, you know, recommend it to the ordinance committee, get it all firmed up so we can uh, take advantage of it before the second half tax bills are due. So I'd like to, to get that going. Um, and basically that's it. Uh, I, I, I am flat. I am flattered by the big turnout. I'm sure you can. it's nice to see that you all come to support the senior tax reduction program. But in all but in all seriousness, while I do have everyone here, if you know of a, of a senior who's your neighbor, a relative, somebody you you know who might be qualified, uh, even though the program is not set. Have them call my office. I'll take their name, I'll take their number. When the program is rolled out, you know, we, we can get them on board. Um, I know we, we do a good job putting a lot of information on the website. Well, if you know my mom and dad, they're not very technically savvy, so you gotta really push that information out any way you can. So if you know anybody, uh, just have them give me a call. I'll take their name and number. and. When the, the ducks are all in a row, I'll, I'll give them a call and get them enrolled. Uh, and that's about all I have. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, I look forward to working with the Ordinance Committee and the Town Council to get this enacted. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer them. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Councilors have any questions at the moment? No. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Before I open the public hearing on our next item, I suspect we have a recusal oh, do coming. We? Oh, yes. <laughs> I gotta pay attention. Yeah. Uh, yes. Th this, this, uh, we're about to open a public hearing on a new liquor license application and special amusement permit at the well at Jordan's Farm. Yes, I need to recruit, recuse myself. <laughs> Thank you. That seems most appropriate, so yes. I don't think we need discussion. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I will now open the public hearing on the new liquor license application and special amusement permit for the well at Jordan's Farm. Anyone wishing to speak has three minutes. Public hearing is open. Does anyone wish to speak to this application? Could we have your name and address, please? My name is John Voltz, 33 Phillip Road, and I just wanted to bri briefly speak greatly in favor of this. I think the Jordan Farm and the, what they've done at the well is a great benefit to our community. I encourage, uh, hope to see more of the farm to table movement and I think this takes it to be allows it to take it to another level. We're highly supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that'd like to speak to the application? Seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Item number 123, the well at Jordan's Farm, liquor license and special amusement permit. Um, they're requesting a new restaurant, malt, Venice and Spiritus liquor license and special amusement permit for the well at Jordan's Farm, 21 Wells Road. Uh, I would like to uh, ask the town clerk to tell us about this application. And I know that she and the town manager have, have been doing their work on it as they always do with, with permit applications. Right, thank you very much. Um, as Chairman Sullivan said, this is a new liquor license application, so a public hearing was required. We have properly noticed um, with posting here at the town hall and three legal ads in the Portland Press Herald as required. Uh, a special amusement uh, permit is required if an establishment with liquor is having, uh, has uh, going to have dancing and music, uh, a, things of that nature, so that's why the special amusement permit is accompanying the liquor license, and that would run the year uh, with the liquor license. It would coincide with that uh, permit. We have checked with uh, police, fire, and code enforcement, uh, and all their questions have been answered. Um, so at this time, there are no uh, issues or concerns that have been raised. Thank you. 
Did you have anything you wanted to add? Or? If I may, through yeah. the chair, uh, thank you. I, I met with Mr. Williams last at the end of last week, and uh, he had a he had an out of the country catering event, so he was unable to come this evening. Except he did describe what his what his plans uh, are. Uh, the primary thought behind this is to request the liquor license to have control over the cons consumption of alcohol at the restaurant. Right now it's currently operating as a bring your own type of operation and uh, he'd like to have better control over that and higher level of responsibility as well as uh, the opportunity to ex expand what they may be able to offer and uh, if he feels it's the next logical step in the progress. And uh, as Deborah had said, there, are, there have been no issues that have been associated with it, so he's, but he's trying to be in advance of any potential issues that could happen in the future. So uh, definitely in support of, of his request and uh, he seems to have met all the requirements we need. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any comments or questions for either uh, Matt or the town clerk, uh, Councilor Caitlin Jordan? I just have to disclose I'm obviously friends, close friends with Jordan's farm and we, do occasional business with the well, selling them items for their farm to table. So you're disclosing that information, but you don't feel you need to accuse yourself? No. Okay. Any, any other concerns with that? Oh, great. Could I have a motion to uh, approve the Malt Venice Lights, Venice and Spiritus Liquor License and Special Amusement Permit for the, for the Well LLC and Perens Jason Williams at the Well at Jordan Farm, 21 Wells Road, as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Councilor Garvin, is there any more discussion? Although, uh, Councilor Garvin. Quick question. The description of special amusement, is, you mentioned the service, but is, is there a plan for change in types of events held there and things like that? Not in particular, but in, in, in case you, if you have a person that comes and maybe plays guitar uh, for the patrons, uh, that's also, that's under the, the special amusement area. So. Uh, I don't think it's planning any large scale production, but if they do want to have any type of live music that is there to complement the dining experience, I think okay. that's really what they're looking to capture. Thanks. Right, and the town clerk has something she'd like to add. To answer yeah. Councilor Garvin as well, I believe at the end of this month uh, there is going to be a planned event with that's music. Um, so that's uh, another reason I think um, that this is coming before tonight as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. We welcome back Councilor Pennington. <coughs> <laughs> All right. The next item is a public hearing on the establishment of an energy committee. So it, we have a public hearing when we are c considering establishing a new standing committee for the town. <coughs> So, we are opening a public hearing on the establishment of a new standing committee, an energy committee. Public hearing is now open. Would anyone like to address the town council on the establishment of a new energy committee for the town? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Item number 124, the establishment of an energy committee. Um, we voted to consider sending this to the Ordinance Committee in July. The Ordinance Committee voted unanimously to recommend the establishment of an, or, of an energy committee. This was a town goal, town council goal, a few years ago, and we had an, an ad hoc committee uh, in 2016, and we are finally putting all those pieces together to get this going. And I would like to offer uh, Councillor Penny Jordan, um, an opportunity to make comments about this as you were leading the ordinance committee. Yeah, uh, well, I do have a question first because okay. we, seeing as nobody spoke at the public hearing, can we put it forward for a vote tonight or do we need to wait? I think we're, yeah, I don't, I we think can. Okay. we're ready to vote. Okay. We've, we've been looking at this quite a few times and right. for quite a while, so right. I, I don't see any problem with that. Yeah. I mean, normally we like to wait, but in this instance, I think we're all highly versed on this matter. Good. Because um, I would like to put this forward uh, for, um, to establish the energy committee so that we can uh, get moving on some of our goals around um, 
energy savings and research and evaluating what other towns are doing. So I'd like to put forward that we uh, establish this committee. So that is your motion? That is my motion. Is there a second? <coughs> Councilor Straw, any more, any more discussion? Councilor Garvin, I think you were first. Um, I'll be supporting the measure. I just want to reiterate um, my position. I think that um, as we progress uh, and look at um, uh, sort of a broad range of function between uh, the, this potential new energy committee and the existing recycling committee, that I think it makes more strategic sense to have an overall sustainability committee that's modeled after um, those that we see in some other towns, um, along with the potential of um, you know, potentially collaborating with another town um, that actually has staff in place in the form of uh, a sustainability coordinator, like in South Portland, they actually have a coordinator and, and uh, assistant. So um, I, I'm not going to certainly stand in the way of this, but I think that that's the, the more uh, strategic way to move going forward. All right. Thank you. Right. Anyone else? Councilor Randall? I just wanted, just to be clear for the motion, um, I'd like to amend it to include, um, to adopt the amended chapter four boards and committees, just to be clear what, which energy committee we're establishing. Okay, thank you. And- So moved. Okay, so moved, so that's where I'll set with that procedurally. Okay, and I would like to just thank the ordinance committee because I did supply quite a list of recommendations and they graciously reviewed them carefully and I wanted to just thank them for, and I appreciate the uh, effort they took with that. Any more comments? All those in favor of the motion as amended? Oh, te technically, we vote for the amendment and then. Oh, oh I, no, yeah, I sorry. always forget <laughs> It's that. okay. And so, technically, mine was a second if that was a motion on your part, but anyway. All okay. right, so, so well, let me ask the town clerk to tell us what we're supposed <laughs> to do. You're voting on the amendment um, to okay. adopt the chapter four amendments. <laughs> okay, may I have a motion? Or that was Councilor Randall's motion. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Strauss seconds. All, any more discussion? All those in favor? Okay, thank you. And you want to vote on the motion that's in the, and the main motion? That's in yes. <laughs> Would you like to do that? Oh, so Strauss? we already made the motion. Vote on the main yeah. motion as amended. Yep. So we have to do that again too. You yes. have to do that. You have your I'll, motions. Yeah. I'll yeah. move to. Okay. <laughs> All right. And. Will you second? Uh, so we've already moved and seconded and then amended, so I think we just vote. You vote. That could be wrong. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor? I know. I always get confused. Thank you. It's a good thing we have a lot of <laughs> <laughs> here. Okay. Moving on. The next item is a public hearing on the, per view, on the uh, review of the proposed <coughs> settlement agreement relating to Paper Street sections of Surf Surfside Avenue. Before I open the public, public hearing, I'd like to remind the audience of uh, the Town Council rules of decorum for, for meetings, public meetings, including the public hearing. Everyone has, that would like to speak to us has three minutes. We, will, we conduct the public hearing as long as there are people here wishing to address us. Uh, there will be no applaud, no approval or disapproval, or any comments about any statements made. And I would, again, request any, everyone to be polite and respectful of all that is said and all opinions that are offered. Oh, yeah, I will. Um, and before um, I open it, I would like to introduce uh, Derwood Parkinson, who is going to make some comments and give us some information before we begin our public hearing. Good evening, members of the council. Members of the public, I'm Derwood Parkinson. I'm here tonight with uh, some other members of my law firm, Bergen and Parkinson. Uh, Sue Driscoll is a 30-year litigator with the firm and uh, with an emphasis in municipal law. She and I and Ben McCall, who's to her left, are, we're all municipal lawyers. Uh, we're municipal litigators. Uh, we took on this case as special counsel for the town, uh, have been involved with it since the beginning. It's a Superior Court case, Cumberland County Superior Court, um, and uh, we have engaged in the required process of mediation. That mediation uh, occurred on July uh, 19th, um, and that mediation was with uh, a very experienced mediator, a former uh, Justice of the Superior Court, Robert Crowley. 
Uh, prior to the mediation, we uh, worked extensively to research um, all relevant issues in the case, the title to the properties, the, the deeds, the surveys, the relevant law. Um, it's a very difficult area of the law. Um, I, I've made the quip that no one studies up to be a paper street lawyer in law school. Now I'm calling Ben street lawyer. Um, I don't know if he appreciates that title or not. But um, we spent a lot of time working up the case, preparing uh, for uh, the mediation. We worked uh, collaboratively with the other attorneys, as we always do, and they work collaboratively with us back. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean it's a, uh, a buddies club. We, we, um, we, f we argue over the issues, and we fight over the issues uh, that need to be fought over, and we agree on the things that hopefully uh, make sense to agree on. So after a very long day of uh, mediation, uh, and in, at that mediation, the uh, chairman, uh, Jessica Sullivan, Jamie Garvin, uh, Sarah Lennon, and Matt Sturgis uh, there on behalf of the town, uh, an agreement in, was reached. Uh, that agreement, of course, is subject to uh, the approval of the council after a public hearing. Uh, we've met in executive session to review the details of the uh, agreement uh, with the council. Uh, a lot of good questions were asked. Of course, no decision was made in executive session whether to approve that agreement. Uh, that will come after this process, I understand, at a, at a, a subsequent uh, meeting. So um, there's been a lot of good uh, feedback. We've uh, got a lot of very able attorneys in, in this town who've uh, contacted us and asked questions, and uh, hopefully we've responded where we could. Uh, to them. Um, there's, like any uh, complicated legal case, there's room for a difference of opinion. Uh, there's room for difference of uh, interpretation. Um, but that kind of goes with the territory. Let me just hit the high, high points of uh, what we're talking about in terms of an agreement. Uh, that the town will release any right title and interest it has in Surfside Avenue or any strip of uh, land lying between Surfside Avenue and the ocean. Um, now, it's, I want to be very clear when I say release any interest. That would be only that po those portions of Surfside Avenue that abut the plaintiff's property. And so we're not talking about the uh, a part of Surfside Avenue that has the gravel, the gravel portion. We're talking about the pilot point portion. And, and when we're talking about that portion, we're not talking about every lot, because not everybody was a plaintiff. We're talking about the portion of Surfside Avenue that's in front of the plaintiff's properties. Um, the second key uh, point is that the consent judgment includes language that the town will um, consider uh, through consent judgment the, that those portions of Surfside Avenue to be deemed vacated. And you'll recall we have had many meetings talking about what that, that process is. <laughs> Three buckets. One is uh, uh, where the paper street is accepted. Another bucket is where the, uh, the acceptance is deferred for another 20 years or another bucket which is deemed vacated. So what we're transferring is the, the postponement of, of the vacation, of putting it off for another 20 years into the deemed vacated column. Um, as a part, a further part of this, and this was a, a significant part of the discussion, there was discussion about um, what would be the impact on the other property owners uh, in and around that area. What, what about the private rights? Now, we only represent the town. We didn't represent the, the people, and there are many of them, who might be a, affected or might have an interest in uh, walking over and, and using the Surfside Avenue portion that will be uh, deemed vacated. But nonetheless, we tried to uh, come up with language that would uh, increase uh, their rights or improve their rights, I should say, uh, by them, uh, the plaintiffs agreeing not to pursue certain statutory remedies against them uh, in, a, in a subsequent action and, or subsequent uh, legal procedures, and that's written in. And, and most importantly, there's a line in the consent final judgment, this is in paragraph 13, which is, um, says, nothing in this agreement shall diminish the private rights of any persons uh, or, to the portions of Surfside Avenue that abut the Khalidi property, the Leopold property, the Summer Ross property, the Wooden property, and the Pilot Point property. So as I said, we don't represent those folks, but uh, efforts were uh, made to not 
unintentionally or to unintentionally uh, affect them, you know, by accident, sort of law of un unintended consequences that we would somehow by this consent judgment, uh, you know, diminish their, their situation. And, and so that was the purpose of in inserting that language. Now you probably will hear more, I expect you will. Some people will say it doesn't go far enough, it doesn't go, uh, there's not enough there. Um, but there's a couple of things I think that we have to uh, talk about and agree uh, really aren't proper matters uh, for at least me to be discussing. One is, or for you to be discussing, which is, one is what happened in the mediation. Uh, that, that what happens in the mediation is uh, confidential. And in other words, there was discussions back and forth about the legal issues, about the uh, financial issues, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, secondly, to talk about our uh, litigation strategy because uh, litigation strategy is just that. It's the, it's the playbook, of, you know, what, I won't do a football analogy. Maybe Matt would enjoy it, but uh, you wouldn't turn over the playbook. What we might do or wouldn't do in the future is something that we would um, prefer for obvious reasons to hold back in the event that this agreement's not approved. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, changing the agreement and we've uh, worked conscientiously uh, to come up with the best possible language. Uh, maybe there's better language that somebody can come up with, but this is the best possible language that we can have the plaintiffs agree to uh, after considerable discussions after the, the mediation. Uh, so I don't think that there's any room other than perhaps a typo type of a situation uh, to change the terms of the consent a proposed consent agreement. Um, I've, so the consent agreement, of course, also provides uh, for a payment of $500,000 uh, by the plaintiffs to the town, uh, which would be deposited in, into the land acquisition fund to enable the town to purchase and preserve additional public land in the future. So. What happens is if the town has approved this consent and judgment, it will be approved, we believe, by the court. Uh, normally those are, um, the court will read them and we believe uh, sign the consent judgment. Uh, we would also be waiving any rights of appeal uh, and as would the other side would be, be the plaintiffs. And the terms of this agreement would be a binding upon uh, not only the town in perpetuity, but the uh, heirs, successors, and assigns of, of the plaintiffs. So the idea is a clean break, finality. Um, some might say that it, it doesn't accomplish that, uh, but we believe um, that we're in an imperfect world, but it does a lot to um, bring closure to this on terms that are um, extremely uh, favorable to the town in terms of the financial part and in terms of bringing closure to the issue of whether this is a paper's there's two issues here. One is, is Surfside Avenue continue to be a paper street? And then if, if so, is it a paper street um, that can be used as a walking trail? And so um, those are the two issues. Uh, the plaintiff's first uh, argument, of course, is there is no longer a paper street because it's lapsed. Even though it's been postponed uh, legally in terms of acceptance, they believe under the common law of Maine, it, it's lapsed. Um, then the second issue that even if it hasn't lapsed, it is not appropriately used as a trail. And as I've said before, uh, that is a sort of new territory under Maine law. And so as a matter of sort of mitigating risk and rolling the dice on that question, um, the, at least um, at the time of the mediation, it was felt that that was uh, a, a prudent way to resolve uh, th those risks through this settlement. Unless there's any questions. Yes. Thank you. Before you step down, do any councils have questions for Deward at this time? Can I? Of course. Penny Jordan. Um, I'm asking a question based on a question that somebody submitted. And when you were explaining the, um, the, the question is, does a paper street need to be vacated as a whole? That can, is confusing to some people. It can be vacated in parts. Yeah, we believe that the, the paper street can be vacated in parts. Um, the, the, the problem was um, with entering, a, we're dealing with a court case with the, brought by the plaintiffs who brought it. Um, 
and not all of the possible plaintiffs and all the possible owners. So we're dealing with a set of rights uh, that uh, in the paper street in front of them. And yes, we believe it could be in part. We, we see no reason why it can't be. Okay. Councilor Garvin? We actually did just that in the fall of 2016 when we partially vacated a portion of Thompson Road. Okay, so there's an Road. example. So of that. there was a, a length up to a certain point that we extended, and then everything beyond that point was, was deemed vacated as part of that process. And I, there might have been one or two others from the list of 50 or so that we dealt with, but I remember that one in particular. So. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Councilor Straw. So, uh, Councilor Garvin's points, great. That's uh, in effect what I was looking for. Uh, in addition to the factual instance in Cape, are you aware of any court cases where a court has ever said you can vacate in part as opposed to in its entirety? No. So, potentially, we expose ourselves to that argument. Well, uh, we expose ourselves. Uh, I mean, what we have is uh, two parties have made an agreement and, and with, with no right of appeal. So, um, I. I, I think, and, and others have uh, chosen not to join the case. So it makes it more remote that that could be challenged. But just to be clear, the other parties who have, no, or the other landowners who have chosen not to be part of the case, if we vacate in part, we expose ourselves to the argument that you have vacated in whole, and we're unaware of any case law supporting our yes, position? Yes, that's, that's correct. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you. start. So I will uh, open the public hearing and again I want to remind everyone of the Town Council Rules of Decorum. You have three minutes. Your name and address please. George Foley, <coughs> 9 Pilot Point Road, one lot away from the street. <coughs> Pardon me, I think eyes are getting older. Um, I sent a letter into the town council, which you're aware of. I asked that it be read. I am unaware if it has been or not, so I will read it here. Dear councilors, this paper street was always intended to belong to everyone in town. The developer specifically placed this street between the properties in this development and the ocean with the express intent to prevent abutting property owners from stopping anyone from enjoying the beauty of two lights, the ocean, and recreation in this area. Fishing is available off the rocks as well. All of the original residents also supported access to this valuable and beautiful public space. They recognize just how special every bit of coastline is and just how wonderful it is for all of the residents of Cape Elizabeth, not just five rich families that moved in from away and want to stop everyone else from enjoying this wonderful recreational area. Recreational areas spread throughout the town help reduce the overuse of each area and reduces traffic congestion, etc. Recreational areas, green spaces, and trails set Cape Elizabeth apart from many other towns and increase property values for everyone in the neighborhood, proven by looking at houses within 3,500 uh, 3, feet of a trail system. When two of these five families forced the neighbors to go to court in the last couple of years, the court ruled that the town had not abandoned its right to accept the paper street. We have done all the heavy lifting for you. Now the council can do the right thing and preserve this valuable asset for all town residents by accepting Atlantic Place Surfside Avenue paper street permanently. We recognize the value of preserving all open space when we purchased Fort Williams years ago and prevented developers from turning it into a housing development. I'm so glad we were part of that decision to preserve Fort Williams <laughs> as a part for all to enjoy. I sincerely hope this town council has the backbone and integrity to do what is right for all citizens of Cape Elizabeth and accept the entire length of Atlantic Place and Surfside Avenue, Paper Street. Stand up to the intimidation of the five families and listen to the 1,400 residents who signed the petition. Listen to the original developer who placed the street there on purpose. Listen to the 110 other families in Shore Acres who also support keeping this valuable resource for everyone to enjoy. Above all, remember the short-term single-time payment of 500K will forever be remembered by our children and their descendants as very short-sighted for a property worth well over two million today, but priceless as a town asset when preserved forever for all to enjoy. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having this public hearing. My name is Mary Ann Lynch. I live at 2 Old Colony Lane. And I really do want to thank you for your attention and the huge commitment that you all make as counselors. I know how much time it takes, and I deeply appreciate it. And I also know that you are all approaching this in good faith. But I am here tonight because I believe the proposed settlement is a very bad deal for Cape Elizabeth at any price. The town has a right to accept the paper street. The abutters purchased the property with the full knowledge of the paper streets. Last summer, a handful of abutters sued the town, arguing that the town had relinquished its rights to the paper streets. I would also tell you that the mediation process, which I'm very familiar with as a lawyer, is very flawed in this particular case, where one side is at the table with their lawyers. The other side, the town council, um, had at least one counselor who was already on record wanting to give away the property a year ago um, for um, no compensation at all. But most importantly, real estate is not fungible. This paper street is an asset to the neighborhood and to the entire town. Public coastal access is reduced yearly by development. You have a unique opportunity to preserve the incipient rights to the access. I urge the council to accept the paper street and defend the lawsuit, which will provide a final resolution to the property rights that have been in dispute. I want to be clear, I think that some principles are worth fighting for. And I know I've heard folks say that they're concerned about the cost of litigation. I will tell you as a taxpayer, some things are worth fighting for. And I will tell you as a former counselor, some things are worth fighting for. Um, I also think that accepting the settlement will create a very bad precedent and will encourage others to sue the town when the town is trying to act in the interests of all of the citizens. Cape Elizabeth is a desirable place to live for a number of reasons, not the least of which is our system of neighborhood trails, which as the er our earlier speakers pointed out, takes pressure off all of the other neighborhoods. Um, that system has been developed over 30 years and has relied in some good extent on paper streets. So uh, I, this is a, just such a bad deal for the town. Um, this settlement is not in the interest of anyone. It's not in the interest of anyone except the five abutters. And so I urge you to reject the settlement, accept the paper street, and vigorously defend this uh, litigation. And thank, I also- Thank you, your time is up. Okay, I also have with me a letter from former town councilor Ann Swift Kayata. She could not attend tonight, but she wanted to be clear that she is also very opposed to this, and I will give you this letter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I, I'm uh, Tom Dunham, and I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lane with my wife, Sandy. We bought our first house in Cape Elizabeth in 1978. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you regarding the Shoreacre Paper Street issue. I happened to attend the recent public forum regarding this contentious issue and decided on my own to investigate further as a taxpayer and as a person who has had a career in marketing, industrial, and commercial real estate in Maine for over 40 years. I, look, <clears throat> I took the initiative to drive over to Shore Acres and gain permission to trespass over one of the residential lots affected by the mediation. I walked down deteriorated wooden steps to a very <coughs> limited area where the owner had a vegetable garden. It was obvious to me that this use within the paper street was open and notorious for many years, which suggests an adverse interest claim. This and other lot owners, owners' activities, I think, could easily be documented since this subdivision was approved in, <clears throat> over 100 years ago in 1911. From a practical perspective, public use of this strip seems fraught with issues given the topography, the narrow width, 
and in my view, I would feel very uncomfortable walking or trespassing in front of a private residence. As a result of my investigation, as a citizen and as, as a taxpayer, I fully support the mediation terms with one major exception. In my view, the $500,000 settlement is very generous, particularly coupled with the expected increase in the annual real estate taxes each lot owner will be confronted with. It is likely to be $34,000 on an annual basis over 10 years. That's $340,000 in additional resources to the town. I am opposed to the suggestion that the $500,000 be applied to future open space projects. That is too subjective and political. What I would suggest is that the $500,000 be set aside in a trust to establish an endowment to support the maintenance and improvements to Fort Williams in perpetuity. Certainly it would have a much broader appeal to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and would establish an entity that citizens could contribute to. This would truly benefit the most Cape citizens. By establishing an endowment, it would likely generate future contributions and could easily grow to several million dollars. If the tax assessment increase is $34,000, it also would be earmarked to the endowment <coughs> and this settlement would be nearly a million dollars in 10 years. I am sure many Cape families would contribute and and my wife and I would as well. In summary, please approve the mediation terms before you. It is generous and is in the best interest of all Cape citizens. It does not pay to litigate in this case, and I think the law donors have a very strong case due to adverse interest. The last, last Your time question, is up, Mr. Last Dunham. question I have is how much have we spent to date on this issue as a taxpayer? Thank you. Good, good evening, my name is David Soley. I work in Portland and I am one of the lawyers representing one of the parties in this case. I wanted to thank the council for the tremendous professionalism that it has shown throughout this controversial process. I, I'm in awe of how the councillors have worked hard to reach an issue, have put in thoughtful opinions and have wisely used time. This issue of Surfside Avenue has been going on for many years. The litigation was brought because it was perceived that there was no resolution in sight. Nobody, I believe, on either side wanted litigation. The litigation involved a strip of land which is hardly used, is covered with backyards, and much of it is perched on an eroding, dangerous cliff. There's no beach here at issue. There's no public access points at issue. Uh, both sides retained Judge Robert Crowley. Judge Crowley is one of the best mediators in the state of Maine on these type of issues. It was a very difficult case. This is a very difficult case. The mediation took virtually all day. The parties, all of them, including the town, negotiated in good faith Present from the town was three town councilors, the town manager, and two attorneys. Uh, the hardworking town councilors included the chair, Jessica Sullivan, the former chair, James Garvin, and councilor Sarah Lennon. With the help of Judge Crowley, and it took a lot of help, it took a lot of time, we finally struck a deal. It is a fair deal. Everybody signed off on the deal. Nobody was in love with the deal. It was, in fact, a compromise. We believe that we would have won this case. We believe that the town has no rights over Surfside Avenue. And we believe that even if the town did have some rights, and, and we don't think it does, the only thing the town could do with this uh, strip of land is build a street. And I think we all know and understand that building a street on this eroding cliffside area would violate numerous shoreland zoning uh, regulations. Nobody is looking forward to the tremendous cost of litigation, the tremendous cost of trial. It is my understanding that in the Goose Rocks case, the town of Kennebunkport has incurred legal bills approaching $2 million with, uh, with no end in sight in that case either. 
But in this case, due to the professionalism of the town council, due to the help from the mediator, due to the working arrangements with the lawyers, we were able to strike a deal in good faith. The parties, the property owners, stand by the deal in good faith. The property owners are not interested in making any changes to it. Obviously, we prefer to settle the case. Mr. Soli, your time is up. Thank you very much. Richard Lemieux, 10 Waven Road. I have lived in Shoreacre since 1985 and have followed this controversy closely over the past five years or so. I shake my head thinking of how much time and taxpayer money has been expended by the town and the council, as well as by the abutters, for 800 feet of the undeveloped portion of the Paper Street known as Surfside Avenue. I know, as well as some of the councilors who have been involved from the inception, how this all got started and how it has escalated to the point of a lawsuit all over a paper street that has been in place since the original site plan of 1912. Rest assured, there's no consensus within the neighborhood <clears throat> on the path forward, including many non abutters to Surfside Avenue. There's only one path to ending this controversy over 800 feet of the paper street being addressed in the lawsuit, and that is for the town to vacate the undeveloped portion of the street. If it is accepted or extended, the lawsuit will proceed <clears throat> at great cost to all parties involved. The fractured relationships within the neighborhood will persist and possibly escalate. We are not a neighborhood lacking in access to the shoreline and water, with the land trusts Trundy Point and with a developed portion of Surfside Avenue. I hope you'll give serious consideration to vacating the undeveloped portion of the Paper Street and allow the neighborhood to heal over time and to be, permit you, the council, and town to redirect your attention to other important matters before you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Heather Bounds. I live at 11 Wildwood Drive. <clears throat> My husband John and I have lived in Cape Elizabeth for 42 years. The first 29 years we lived in Shore Acres. That's where we raised our family. We have followed the path dispute that has been going on there for over five years now. We are hoping our town council will stop using taxpayers' money for this purpose. We are very concerned the litigation and legal fees will continue to mount if the council does not pass the mediation agreement. We believe you are throwing away taxpayers' money on an 800-foot rocky coastline path that may never come to fruition. The owners involved have worked with you to resolve this problem. Please work with them. Make a decision on sound fiscal responsibility for all the residents of Cape Elizabeth by passing the mediation agreement. Thank you very much, all of you, for all your work. Thank you. I think you all know me. My name is Paul Mosen. I live at 22 Trundy Road in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. And thank God I didn't become a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I ended up on the faculty at Yale for 10 years, but I'm listening to lawyers, and they have the crystal ball. They're a little bit different in terms of what they're saying is going to happen. If you accept the agreement, we're not going to have any problems. Everything's going to be wonderful. If you don't accept the agreement, you're going to be putting out all kinds of taxpayer money and legal fees. Well, guess what? If you accept the agreement, you're going to end up with a lot of dealing with a lot of legal fees from the people that I'm talking to. Well, you remember, and I'm just being redundant, I understand, that we got over 1,400 signatures of people who said, accept those paper streets. The ones we were talking about were Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point. We don't seem to be heading closer in that direction of doing that. And it boggles my mind, but to the people that I talk with in this community, it's boggling their mind too. We started GoFundMe uh, 
site and money starting to pour in because if we have to sue, we will sue. You, are, you will not or should not give up or go along with the deal that's been offered. I don't know of anyone, and maybe it's not allowed, from the SOS coalition that was invited to sit down and discuss this. Oh, I know you're representatives of the people, but at the same time, some of you already have predetermined ideas as to what you're going to vote on and what you're going to support. Rather than get out there and talk to the thousands of people in this community that do not want to see those paper streets go away, they want to see them accepted by the town. And you need to think about all of that. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, John Voltz, 33 Phillip Road. Um, as I think it's evident to everyone that there's a great deal of interest in this. Uh, I look at a uh, topic, and I look at the agenda item, it's a sort of review the settlement agreement. And I went and I read through it and I looked at it and I thought to myself, you know, I don't think I can do that. And I'm going to pause here for a minute and sort of take a diversion and talk about uh, a story about Lincoln my father told me. It's about a game called horse trading. And what they would do was you just agree with your friend that uh, you'd meet on Friday afternoon by the bridge and you'd bring your horse and he'd bring his horse and whatever horses you had, you'd trade. And so the first time he, Lincoln played this, he went around and thought, I am not going to be beat by this. And he found the sorriest, nearly dead, sway back one step from the glue factory horse that he could. He bought it for $5. And he went down there Friday afternoon. He was really excited. He says, I am so going to win until he saw coming down the path his friend with a wooden sawhorse <laughs> slung over his shoulder that probably cost him a quarter. And the point of this story is, you don't know if a deal is any good until you can see both sides of it. And we don't see both sides of the deal here. All we see is $500,000. We have no information as to the context that you're looking at. And this is not part of the negotiation. This is the facts that you should have and have presented to us to be able to evaluate this deal. We don't know what those lots are assessed at. We don't know what the market value of what you think those lots are assessed at. We don't know the portion of the square footage that's being vacated. We have no context in which to evaluate both sides of this deal. There's a whole bunch of other issues that come into it as well, but even just the basics of what to assess aren't there. I would request that you put forward and put this information in your deal in context so people can see both sides of the deal and make their own assessment. Notice it and have a hearing so people can comment intelligently about what this deal is and not just one side of it. We can't do that. I can't do that. I'll be able to make some comments in writing based upon what I've seen to date, but right now I can't make an assessment of the deal, and I don't know how you could if this is all the information that you're looking at, and if you're looking at more than that, notice us in public and let us evaluate it. The other thing before I finish up is the same thing is true on the process. This is a complex process. He talked before about you know, sometime later there's going to be a vote. This process is, a, this is an important issue. The process itself should be visible. We would like a summary chart, something that looks like that, that tells us this is how the decision making process works. This is where it's going to go. So we can make our comments and assessments appropriate to the point in the process we're at. Because some of the things I hear now seem like they're too late. Some of the things I hear seem like, well, maybe they're not ready for to hear that yet. Mr. Volz, your time is up. Thank you very much. I look forward to hopefully hearing more information that I can discuss this deal appropriately. Good evening. My name's Mike Thorne. I live at 15 Highview Road. I want to thank my counselors. Um, I know you don't do this job for the vanity license plates or the junkets to European capitals for legislative get-togethers, so thank you for what you're doing. But I want to ask you a question, and it's the deathbed question. So when you're reviewing your life's work, including the difficult, sometimes tedious town of representing this town that you love, 
how you will feel about these 800 precious linear feet of oceanfront, which don't seem to be eroding really very much from my, from my observation. And to, to ask yourselves if when our children and our grandchildren are living in this town, hopefully, if anybody with the name of Jordan will still be able to walk along the shore without owning a five or $10 million property. I'm a refugee from Massachusetts by way of Maine. I lived in a house that appreciated by a million dollars just by the accident of buying a house in the right place or the wrong place. And there are hundreds of thousands of people with deep pockets that will be moving to a wonderful town and buying property as a second or a third home and not being a neighbor because they're too busy living someplace else or someplace other else. Or, and so our town is going to change dramatically. So I ask you if in those last memories of your life you might take some pride in thinking that you preserved for your children or your grandchildren 800 magnificent feet of this little town. And I think you would feel very good about that. And I might add that I'm amazed that our neighbors to the north and south Portland took on the oil industry so that they would become a spigot for Canadian oil, and they won. So I would think that we could take on the lawyers, the very capable lawyers of five very entitled, unneighborly people and prevail. And I ask you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Leah Hobson. I live at 20 Charles Road, nowhere near Trendy Point or Shore Acres. Um, I live about, I've lived there for 25 plus years. I live about a quarter mile from Cliff House Beach. And I'm afraid that this settlement, if it goes through, will set a precedent and it won't be long before somebody on Glen Avenue or Seaview decides that I don't want people walking over there. I don't want her dog going over there. Um, that worries me. I also um, live about 12 feet from the sidewalk on my very humble little street. Cars go by every day, people walk their dogs, kids skateboard, kids even come into my yard to play ball. And that's okay, because I'm part of the community. Um, in my real life, I'm a kindergarten teacher. Not here in Cape Elizabeth, but on the other side of Portland in a not so fortunate community. One of the first things that I've done this year is try to build a classroom community of five and six year olds who have not learned all of this at home. They have not learned how to share. They have not learned that this is a wonderful community. They don't know anything about Cape Elizabeth. They'll be really lucky if we can afford to take a bus over to Fort Williams in the spring. But we've got a stretch of land here that I don't think is really eroded too much. I agree with people. It's worth a heck of a lot more, or actually it's priceless. It's worth more than $500,000. You, can you can't buy a piece of land on the water in Maine for $500,000. And I think that people need to take a step back and think about what it is to be a community and learn how to share. My last point is that um, one of the lawyers mentioned something about the $500,000 being put into a fund to buy other property where people could walk. Why would we do that? We have a piece of property where people can walk. Why would we do that? That just doesn't, it doesn't sit with me to just push it off, let somebody else do it, not in my front yard. Um, anyway, I, I hope that the, um, I hope the committee will consider that the property's priceless. We don't want to separate or set a precedent. 
And this is a community. We should be able to stay a community and do things together and share what we have in this town. Even if it means somebody walking in front of your house or playing ball. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Andrew Ingalls. I live at 9 Wombeck Road, which is uh, in Shore Acres at the foot of Pilot Point. I've watched this entire episode unfold right in front of me, and it's been terrible for the neighborhood. Say what they will, there aren't 110 families in Shore Acres that want to see this path, this turned into a path. Um, I certainly don't. They've, they've made the people who live there out to be rich, mean-spirited, and they're not, they're nice people. They bought their houses expecting it to be more or less what it is. What's not brought up here is, I, I wrote an edit, uh, editorial letter that expressed this. There's a tremendous amount of open space in Shore Acres right now. I fish all along the rocks. You could go down to the rocks in front of where this lawn path would be, and it is a lawn path. It's not a, it's not a, there is a cliff, and it's not good fishing. If you go down a little further, right along Surfside Road, there's plenty of fishing. I fished there all summer. I caught two stripers on Saturday. There's plenty of open space. We've got the entire beach. We've got all of Trendy Point. There are ample, ample opportunities in our neighborhood to enjoy the ocean. This path in front of this house is rude. It's just rude. You're walking right in front of people's houses. I don't want to fish there. I don't want to walk there. Why would I? There's so much space available. You know, I look out, I walk my dog every day on Surfside Road. There are nice people down there. I look out at, I look out at uh, you know, Halfway Rock. It's gorgeous. Everybody has that access. Anyone, anybody <laughs> want to find it, come see me. I'll show you where you can walk all over the place without being rude. They are nice people. I can't stand this idea that they're villains. They're not. I know them all. They're nice people. My daughter babysits for them. Um, the idea of spending more money on this from the town is anathema to me. It's the worst possible use for funds. Kids, my kids in school, the schools are falling apart. Fighting against these people who are paid a tremendous amount of taxes now to put in a path that's rude and thoughtless and completely unnecessary is the wrong thing to do. I live right there. Don't, don't buy this argument that everybody in Shore Acres uh, wants a path there because it's not true, believe me. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Schumadine. I'm an attorney in Portland, and I represent the other four landowners in this deal. Uh, and I just wanted to come up here to finish the remarks that uh, Attorney Soley started with, and really just point on two things. Uh, before I get to that, I just want to say, you know, it's a deal, it's a compromise. The sign of a good compromise is that no one's happy. I think that's probably a pretty good description of what's going on here. And with that said, there are two points that I do want to make to finish up with what Attorney Soli was saying. The first concerns the town. And yeah, I know because I'm on the other side, you're going to probably discount this. But I do think the town faces a pretty substantial risk here. But I'm not talking about risk about losing or winning. I'm talking about risk of what happens if you lose and if you lose in a certain way. We filed a motion for summary judgment. We filed that motion for summary judgment saying that if you're given a paper street, all that you're given is the right to build a complete road. You're not given a right to put in a path. Now, Councillor Lynch, former Councillor Lynch, came up here and talked about how much of your green belt is based upon paper streets. If we prevail on that issue, and we believe that we will, that's a substantial precedent and a very bad precedent for the town and for towns all, all throughout as far as what can happen with those paper streets. I would suggest that it, for the town, it's a better situation to, to not pick that fight right now and just continue on with what you have been doing because most of the other issues have not engendered this type of controversy. People don't care, then, then it's, it's fine. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that there's been a lot of discussion, particularly in some of the comments that have come to the council, about the private rights that are at issue here. This case is not about private rights. It's about the town's public rights. Uh, so when we were, went to mediation, we initially did not want to talk about private rights at all because we just didn't think it was part of this. Nonetheless, the town insisted, and based on that, we engaged in a long back and forth that I think went the whole day. I mean, it went almost the entire day in which we were talking about private rights. And we put in things into this agreement that protect the private rights. 
you know, which we did as an accommodation to try to meet the town halfway. If we could just write the settlement, we wouldn't have put that in because it's, it's really a separate thing. But we have and we stand by it, and we stand by that. In addition, one thing, we, we're not interested in you know, going back and renegotiating, but we have agreed uh, that uh, if the town approves this, we'll engage in a facilitated discussion with the neighborhood to try to get to some sort of closure on this. Because it, as I think everyone would say, this has been bad. None of, our, none of my clients are, have been particularly happy about any part of this. They've been vilified at, at times and uh, really treated very horribly at times as well. And really all they're trying to do is, is to just live their lives uh, based on what's, what's going on here. And they feel like they've been unfairly vilified. So they want to have a discussion with the neighbors, of course. They want this to, become, to go back and become healing. And we think the way to do that is for the town to settle this issue as far as the town's concerned, and then let the private parties get together and figure things out, because we think they can. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria Villant, 58 Cottage Farms Road. When I spoke at the last meeting, I told you that I did not approve of the mediated agreement. And it wasn't so much the sale price that was so wrong, it's that the town ended into mediation from a position of strength but mediated as if the town was in a position of weakness. For example, the plaintiffs are claiming adverse possession or squatter's rights, and our position of strength is Maine law requires 20-year periods of uninterrupted occupation payment of property taxes on the property. Uh, each plaintiff, they haven't lived on their property for 20 years. Also, the plaintiffs claim their property extends to the low water mark of the Atlantic Ocean. Our position is each plaintiff, plaintiff has a deed that specifies Surfside Avenue, not the Atlantic Ocean, as bounding the track conveyed. The plaintiffs claim squatters right by acknowledging they did construct numerous obstructions in the paper street. Once again, our position is the required 20 year period of obstruction. As noted, the plaintiffs have not occupied those homes for 20 years. The plaintiffs also claim the town took no action to accept or even acknowledge any portion of Surfside Avenue within a reasonable period of time. Now the statute of limitation extinguishes the right to create or claim an easement. So prior to the Paper Street Act, the time period in which a dedicated road could be accepted was limited to a reasonable time. Now an actual timetable for municipal action is spelled out within the Paper Street Act. Subsequently. Another position of strength is the town is following the Paper Street Act. On September 9th, 1997, the town council voted to extend its rights in paper streets. And once again, it voted unanimously on October 5th, 2016. Our position of strength is in 2013, the town council adopted the Greenbelt Plan that acknowledged Surfside Avenue as a potential trail. We are in a position of strength because one of the plaintiffs lost his recent court decision over Atlantic Place. From our position of strength, we should not have negotiated the price to sell this paper street. Instead, we should have negotiated when the abutters would remove their obstructions, where the path would go, and how much the town was willing to spend on buffering to block the plaintiff's view of the people enjoying their incipient and implied rights. We know you wish to settle this issue and bring peace back to our town. However, the risk you now create if you accept the mediated agreement is the precedent you will establish that will lead to further lawsuits from abutters to other controversial paper street extensions, such as Lighthouse Point Road. And settling based on adverse possession will open a can of worms from abutters claiming squatters' rights when they do not even meet the state definition as in this case. So I urge the council to not accept this negotiated agreement. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David Laurie. I live at 189 Spurwink Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I've never been to this site, and I don't know that I'll ever go there, but I'm here to urge you not to take this deal because, or not to compromise, particularly not to compromise for money. Uh, I've, I'm a taxpayer and I will pay my share of the town's legal expenses in this case if necessary. And I, I do view it as necessary. You've got, a, you've got a good 
team of lawyers there. I've known both Durwood and Susan for many, many years, and they're very good lawyers, and I think the town has a very strong case. I've heard a whole lot of people who are not obviously not lawyers talking about adverse possession, which cannot run against the sovereign, by the way, and you are the sovereign in this case. And it is a question of abandonment, uh, or was a question of abandonment, I should say. But I think that the court ultimately ought to decide this case based on the legislation and the town's actions since, 1990, since 1997, anyway. Uh, at that time, you actually voted uh, in reliance on the statute, which gave the town the right to make a decision as to whether to accept, to vacate, or, uh, or extend the period of time for acceptance. You voted to accept it. You, your predecessors voted to accept it. And that was a binding legal decision which was never appealed. Uh, there's something called res judicata, or in this case collateral estoppel is a technical legal term, where a thing is decided and you can't come back and you can't litigate it if you don't appeal it. Moreover, not only did they not appeal it, they also didn't challenge the town's decision to extend it during the six-year statute of limitations. Or long, that, that was 2003. Uh, you know, in fact, they should not be in court right now. They should have been thrown out of court. I know the town hasn't made that motion yet, but it will at some point. But for those, both of those theories, I think, I shouldn't call them theories, both of those legal doctrines uh, have a force and effect of law. And I think the town has a very strong case here, and I don't think you should be giving it up on principle. I don't think you should be giving it up at all, and you certainly shouldn't be giving it up for money. In terms of what's going to cost you, this is not Moody, this is not, uh, Moody Beach, this is not uh, Goose Rocks Beach. Uh, it's not going to cost you $2 million to litigate this case. I'd be surprised. I always underestimate. My clients are always upset with me <laughs> when I tell them what it actually costs later on. But uh, I, I'd be really surprised if this, didn't, if this ran much over $100,000 at most. Uh, but can I say, I see my time is up. Yes, so I will your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Sandy Lawner, and I live at 33 Reef Road. I um, object to the town accepting this agreement because it's based on um, false information. And I want, I, I'm curious as to how you could enter into an agreement that contains a survey that's wrong. Um, it, the survey that um, the plaintiffs presented to you shows property lines to the ocean. And every single recorded deed in um, inshore acres shows that their um, property lines do not go to the ocean. And so if a picture that is part of the materials is a lie. How can we really accept everything else in that? It makes me question everything and it makes me question um, what you were thinking when you thought this was a good deal. And so I hope that you don't accept things as they stand now. Um, I would like to see you accept the paper street and I think that things could go back to normal in the neighborhood with that being done. I live in the neighborhood. When I first moved there, it was wonderful. Everybody loved everybody. We all celebrated Christmas together and sang Christmas carols uh, in a horse-drawn carriage going around the neighborhood. Let's get back to that, but not based on false information. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Daryl Hemian. I live at 8 Avon Road, which is in the neighborhood in question. I walk my dog 
every day down Surfside Avenue, and I am not a lawyer, um, nor did I actually intend to speak this evening, but I would, I would encourage the town to accept the settlement agreement just to give some peace back to the, the neighborhood. Actually, it being over, I think, is more important than a lot of the other points that were brought up today, and, and two other points I'd like to make this evening where it was, I'm an avid user of the trail system in town and an environmentalist, and so I've waffled even personally on this issue all throughout the debate. I've lived in the neighborhood for about four and a half, five years, and I think I'd like to point back to one of my, my neighbors pointed out that, you know, that area of the path in question isn't so much a path, it is people's backyard. And when I think about that, why this has become so contentious is because it's people's homes. And I think the people that live there, I know one family really well, and I've decided instead of like following my environmental instincts, is to side with my friends. Because that's what this is about. It's about people's lives, right? There are, there are neighbors in our town, other friends of mine, that have moved away from this area in question because of all of this. You have uprooted friends and families. Now, that has to, that level of decorum, and we can all disagree all day long here, and I hope that we get up tomorrow morning and I see you and we all shake hands because we can disagree, but I would hope that it all comes back to the fact that the people that live there are just people like you and me, regardless of where they're from or how much money they make. It's about trying to achieve a level of decorum around what's rational for me. So I, I encourage you to accept the settlement. I'm really discouraged that it's actually gotten to this point where we're actually having this conversation, but it is what it is. I think that's the reality. And because of uh, decency, I encourage you to accept it. And I thank you for your time and you volunteering to do this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Jamie Wagner, 30 Hannaford Cove Road. Uh, good to see you all. It's nice to be on this side of the podium instead of your side. Um, I have many friends on both sides of this issue in Shore Acres, and I, I respect and appreciate uh, all the opinions that I've heard expressed tonight. I think people feel very strongly about them. I've, uh, I've been a litigator for 27 years and looked at a lot of fact patterns and looked at uh, a lot of risk and done a lot of risk assessment and I've settled a lot of cases. I've carefully read this draft settlement agreement um, several times and I believe the proposed settlement agreement is a win-win for the people of Cape Elizabeth. It might not feel that way for a handful of people or many people and I empathize with those people. But I believe that if this case stays in court, uh, it will drag on for several years. It will be much more expensive than my friend David thinks it will be. Uh, lawyers in Portland don't cost uh, $100 an hour anymore. A lot of people are charging, I don't know what Durwood charges, but, uh, but uh, you see a lot of bills coming in at 350 an hour, and lawyers spend a lot of time preparing for these cases. I think it could easily go into the three to $400,000 level. Um, and we have a $500,000 payment hanging out there that would go to land acquisition in the town, which is a very attractive thing that could preserve more than 800 feet of land. So, um, and, and again, David's point about race judicata, yeah, that's a legal doctrine that has certain ramifications, but race judicata is litigated every day around the country, in every court of the country, and people differ on whether race judicata applies in any given case, and they, they would diff, differ on it here. So I, I urge the counselors to uh, vote in favor of the settlement and move on to the next thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anita Pettit, 8 Katahdin Road. I want to tell you about a petition underway for the enactment of an ordinance to limit the disposition of shoreline access real estate. Um, article 7, a new Article 7 in the um, Chapter 18, Disposition of Shoreline Access Real Estate. Any sale, release, or other disposition by the town of real estate whether held in fee, via easement, as incipient rights of dedication or otherwise, providing direct or indirect access to shoreline areas, 
and whose retention by the town has been recommended by the Conservation Committee, Fort Williams Committee, Comprehensive Plan Committee, Planning Board, and other duly authorized committee appointed by the town council shall not be sold, released, or otherwise disposed of inconsistent with the recommendation of such committee or board, except by a vote of at least five town council members or following submission to a public referendum which approves such disposition. Notwithstanding 1 MRSA 302, this provision shall apply to any proceeding involving the disposition of town real estate not fully consummated prior to the filing of the petition for enactment of this ordinance with the town clerk. On a personal note, I want to say that I've spent a lot of time in the past year at the town transfer station, the IGA, and the polling station seeking signatures from Cape Elizabeth residents for the petition to accept a Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, Lighthouse Point, Paper Streets. As you probably already know, we have over 1,400 signatures for this petition. And I can tell you from my own experience that somewhere around 85% of the people I talked to were happy to give their signatures. As time went on and people became more aware of the details of the issue, they were approaching our table and asking where they could sign. If you considered the results of our petition drive a random sample, it would be reasonable to project a strong majority view in favor of accepting these paper streets. Participants in the guidance discussions on the Surfside Avenue Atlantic Place paper streets this past February also indicated strong majority support for maintaining the public interest in the paper streets. At that point, the ongoing lawsuit had begun, and people knew that the town would be using resources to defend the public interest in this matter. People at the June polling station were similarly not deterred by the prospect of a legal battle, and in fact seemed more energized than before. It should be obvious to you by now that the overwhelming majority of Cape residents are not interested in an expedient solution to the issue that would forever remove the potential for this shoreline access. If you decide to vote in favor of the proposed mediation settlement, either you have badly misread the mood of the town or will you have chosen to ignore it. As Councilor Sullivan said in the last town council meeting, some things are worth fighting for. This is one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Deborah Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. I would like to say that I think if Derwood Parkinson were asked by the town council and our town government to pursue acceptance, that he would do a darn good job and he'd succeed and it wouldn't be overruled. As president of Shore Acres Improvement Association, an association that was formed in 1963 because folks were trying to shut Surfside down and limit access, I will tell you that we have a unanimous vote of our board for asking the town council to accept Surfside Avenue and Atlantic Place in their entirety. That vote was taken over a year ago and it was confirmed a couple weeks ago. We know that this is what's best for the town and for our member lot owners. I wanted to talk about the deemed vacated. I'm not a lawyer, but I've been reading about this for quite some time. That's the incorrect statute to use. Deem vacated is the statute that's used when the town just lets the paper street expire at the end or either at the beginning in 1997 or at the end of a 20 year period. Once you make a legislative action, take one, that isn't available to you. You have to use another statute that requires much more due process in noticing the lot owners. The town council affirmatively acted to extend their right of acceptance and filed this extension action in the main registry of deeds. The deem vacation statute is a do nothing, let it expire, run out statute and can only come to be by operation of law due to no legislative action. For the operation of a deem vacation, the town has to wait until the end of the next 20 year period and let the town's rights run out by expiration. If the town takes no further action, does nothing by November of 2036, and thereby allows the expiration of paper streets that they extended for future acceptance. That's important. 
Extensions are for future acceptance because you only extend because it's valuable and you might accept it. It's not usually for something that you might vacate um, by the legislative action. Um, those paper streets um, would be deemed vacated at that time if they waited until November of 2036. If you want to vacate an already extended paper street that you've acted on before November of 2036, you need to do so by legislative action and therefore must follow the applicable statute, which is 20, Title 23, MRSA 3027 and 3027A. It requires you to notify all of the lot owners and mortgagees of record, triggering the nece necessity for short acres lot owners to file to protect their rights. Um, please review the Paper Street statutes um, and make sure that what I'm saying is true, but I'm pretty sure it is. Mrs. Murphy, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Please, please, please do not accept this agreement. It's a bad deal. I'm Jim Mora from 5 Wombat Road. I understand the town received more petition signatures than any previous petition to accept Surfside Avenue Paper Street. The town needs to respond accordingly more than the town has to previous petitions. Show us Cape Elizabeth Town Government follows the fundamental American principle of government for the people. It does not act to the advantage of small special interest groups. Bring back the general public's confidence in our town government reject the settlement proposal, accept Surfside Avenue Paper Street. If you accept the settlement proposal, you set a bad precedent that the town can be bought. Bad precedents are instructions. Instructions other lot owners with financial resources will follow to get what they want. As people are successful in following these instructions, more and more people will follow these instructions. This changes the culture the fabric of our town. The settlement will create a town that can and will be bought at the expense of the general public. I do not support the settlement proposal. The proposal is bad for the majority of residents. If you proceed with the proposed settlement anyways, be aware of the following. The settlement proposal, Exhibit A, which showed up in the documents for this meeting, states in note six that lot boundary extensions are based on 33 MS MRSA section 469A. The town has been applying 23 MRSA for paper streets. The town agrees to 33 MRSA that may impact the status of many of the other paper streets in town. As it's now clear some paper streets have significant value, be cautious of agreeing to 33 MRSA until the impact of this on other paper streets in town is known. The town cannot agree to adjacent lot boundary extensions based on 33 MRSA section 469A 6A as the present fee holder, Shore Acres Land Company, or in this case it's heirs, reserve title to the Surfside Avenue Paper Street. You cannot agree to Exhibit A of the settlement agreement. The settlement proposal does not follow the town's land sale and acquisition policy. Please review this policy, including the policy definition of real estate, which includes right of and requirements for Conservation Commission recommendation and closed bids. The Town Council does not have the will to do what the general public clearly wants based on about 1,400 petition signatures. Take this off your task list by bringing this to the voters in November. Thank you. My name is Ray Chevenel. I live at 189 Fowler Road in Cape Elizabeth. I've, I've lived in the Cape since 1968. And for over 30 years, uh, several mornings each week, I would run with my friends down Pilot Point and around that little semicircle that's the current Surfside Avenue where there's a little, like a little road that goes over and hitches onto Algonquin. Uh, recently I walked this whole area and 
It's 800 beautiful, beautiful um, scenery. Uh, you, you stand, right now you really can't get along the, the, the five houses along Pilot Point, so you either have to go to the east end where, the, where that Surfside Avenue uh, comes around the bend, or you go up to Atlantic Place and walk down in and look. But it, it's beautiful, and looking out, um, you know, you, you can't see it, but Africa is uh, the first stop. Um, it's, a, it's a special part of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I would um, ask that you reject this settlement. I uh, ask that you accept the paper street, but I, I really ask as a potential solution that you uh, extend the, the semicircular uh, Surfside Avenue that's already there and basically extend that across, uh, as close as you can to the top of the cliff. I'd, I'd leave some safety and maybe put a fence there, but just extend that eight or 10 feet wide all the way to Atlantic Place. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful spot. Uh, the town and the people of the town would uh, very much appreciate it and, and have a chance to walk there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deidre St. Louis, and I live at 10 Rand Road. Um, I, I'm not sure how to fall on this issue, and after listening to all the discussion, it's made it even kind of um, more difficult for me. I can definitely see both sides. I, I lean towards not settling. However, um, I'm philosophically opposed to giving up um, the potential or the right for potential public access, especially um, along the ocean. Um, and I, I know the one attorney said that this wouldn't happen, but um, I'm especially opposed if it would block access to the general public on the gravel road that's labeled as Surfside Avenue on tax map U12. Oh, and I meant to mention, I just my comments are just kind of food for thought, I guess, at this point. I did have a little trouble um, getting all the information that I wanted from looking at the website, and I, I did still have some questions that were unanswered. I know it's difficult to provide probably all the information that you guys may have access to to the public, but I, I did have some holes in trying to figure the issue out. Um, another food piece of um, food for thought would be uh, if the settlement agreement is approved. Uh, the $500,000 seems kind of low to me. I'm not sure what that was based on. Um, one idea I had was maybe you could look at what the fair market value would be for an easement of the same size in that area. I don't, I don't know if that'd be higher or lower than the $500,000, but I certainly wouldn't want to go lower than the $500,000. Um, and then the last item, um, it addresses language in the proposed settlement agreement. Um, I thought the language regarding the location of the land for which the city would release title is confusing. Um, the proposed settlement agreement map doesn't seem to agree with the language in the, um, the written part of the settlement agreement. And I also had a, di a difficult time reconciling the location of in the proposed settlement agreement with the map of the um, U12-5 Surfside Avenue in the 2015 um, Paper Street report that was modified in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maynard Murphy of 24 Pilot Point Road. I submitted a letter to the council yesterday and I would like that to be uh, submitted as part of the record. There are a lot of holes in the settlement agreement uh, I urge you to reject it. I also urge you to accept Surfside Avenue for future use. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Priscilla Armstrong. I live at 18 Avon Road. Um, Avon Road is a very narrow road and it is not as wide as uh, Surfside Avenue. 
all of Surfside Avenue. Um, and we managed to have cars go up and down it, so I really think there's space for a path. Um, I know that you have been sent copies of original deeds that shore, which demonstrate that the Shore Acres residents have implicit or implied rights to pass over all of the paper streets in subdivision. In fact, if you read some of those deeds, they're really kind of amusing, the ones that were written in 19-whatever, saying you can't have outhouses, only you can have them as long as your house is being built, but then you have to get rid of them, and you can't have apartments, and you can't do this. The developer was pretty specific about what he wanted to happen on those lots. So it wasn't any accident that he included language about um, being able to pass over all of the streets in the development. I've also heard people say, well, we have the gravel portion of Surfside Avenue, which is true, but it didn't just happen to happen. There was a lot of infighting over that and deals being written and people having deeds rewritten. It wasn't magnificently, magnanimously given to all the other people in Shore Acres. It, it was a hard fought battle. And I am also curious um, with the settlement agreement that we were told during all of the discussion of the paper streets that if a paper street is vacated, abutters could um, have possession of 50% and the abutters on the other side would be eligible to claim 50%. While the abutter on the other side in this case is the ocean, they're probably not going to claim it, though maybe in 100 years they will. Um, it seems to me you're giving an awful lot of land away for not very much money. I do not think that the settlement does adequately protect me as a lot owner with deeded rights, and I would urge you to go back to the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Polly Wilcox, 17 Cape Woods Drive. Um, I just have a few things. I've said a few things in the past that made people laugh, so maybe this will lighten the mood. Um, we lived at 12 Surfside Lane when we, or Road, when we moved here and were building a house. And whoever said it's uh, walking in front of that house is like being in their backyard. That, that's true. Um, I don't know what you should do. I thank you so much for doing the job you're doing. It is not easy. Um, I feel so badly for the personalized attacks that are coming through. And um, I was thinking about the comments about the rich people. And, you know, when we lived there, of course, it was a different time, but there was a real sense of community and um, people working together. And the many years that I have lived here, we moved here in 20, 2000, there has been uh, a real sense of community. The lawyer I called when we had legal problems right before my husband's death lived in that neighborhood. And uh, the neurologist who helped me with my multiple sclerosis lived in another Cape neighborhood. And the janitor that I ran to when I was buying something at a store recently was my old friend from Cape High School when I was volunteering there. Uh, I, I really don't think it's good to be pointing figures at who makes what money in this, that, and the other. I hope that there can be some kind of a working together solution. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm Jody Burrow. I live at 5 Wombeck Road. Um, <coughs> I have two points points that I'd like to make. Um, my first point is that uh, people change and properties change and a vote to vacate is forever. This is a 1991 letter from Stuart Wooden, then president of the Shore Acres Improvement Association. 
And at the time, Stuart lived at 33 Trundy Road. And in this letter, he advises the lot owners of Shore Acres to sign a release deed in order to protect their implied and expressed rights to Surfside Avenue and to protect their property values. You see, in 1991, Stuart was a champion for the neighbor's property rights on Surfside Avenue. And now he lives at 33 Point, Pilot Point Road and is one of five plaintiffs suing the town, demanding the town council give up the town's rights to make Surfside a public access point give up the town's right to make Surfside a public access point to the shoreline. Five, five property owners are suing the town. Two are full-time voting residents, the Leopolds and the Woodens. Two are seasonal visitors, the Summers and the Goldmans, also known as Pilot Point LLC and one, the Khalidis, no longer reside at their property on Pilot Point Road. I'd also like to point out that most of the properties that abut Surfside have been bought and sold in the last 10 years. For example, 29 Pilot Point Road has changed hands three times. My point again, people change, property owners change, a vote to vacate, is forever. My second point, the only thing that's changed in this mediation agreement is the offer of $500,000. You could have vacated, you could have protected the rights of Shore Acres, and, and you haven't. The thing that has changed is $500,000. $500,000 for your vote to vacate the paper streets that abut the plaintiff's properties. Cash for votes. Isn't this a legal bribe? Once again, town councilors are being offered money for votes. My question to, the, to you is this. If a mediation agreement with an offer of $500,000 will get you to consider vacating five properties on Surfside, then what amount do you need to accept Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point Road? Mrs. Bro, your time is up. Because here's the thing. You never asked the Cape citizens what they're willing to spend to protect and preserve the shoreline access. Thank they, you. Thank you. Your time is up. Make this a referendum question and let M the people decide. Mrs. Okay. Excuse me. I'm Richard Bryant. I live at 55 Sperling Avenue here in Cape, and I do represent the uh, Shore Acres Improvement Association. I know I have a short period of time, so I'd refer you back to some correspondence I gave you when you were considering the larger paper streets issue back in July. Um, and most recently, last week, I sent you along a letter of, of my correspondence with Dorit Parkinson about some specific issues with the settlement agreement that you're uh, taking comment on tonight. The big picture issue I'd like to point out here is that my client, the Shore Acres Improvement Association, opposes the settlement for two reasons. One, it is not comprehensive, and the second, it doesn't protect the private property rights of other lot owners within the Shore Acres neighborhood. It's not comprehensive in a couple ways. One way is, is, is that it's a product of a mediated um, discussion that didn't include some important people. So implied right holders throughout the subdivision were not at that table. Um, express right holders were not at that table. The fee owners underneath Shoreside Avenue and the uh, Oceanside uh, strip of property beyond Surfside Avenue were not at that table. I know that the town has expressed through several representatives that they had in mind protection of private property holders' rights, and I appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the settlement that came out does protect those rights adequately. Second reason this isn't comprehensive is it only deals with a couple sections of Suicide Avenue. Um, and if you look at the big picture, there are uh, portions of Suicide Avenue between 
the properties of these particular plaintiffs that are not dealt with in the settlement. There's a little analogy story earlier about dealing with the horse trading, and I just look at this as someone thinks they got a $2 million racehorse, and they think, gee, if I sell the right front leg for $500,000, I'll be good. Well, nobody's going to buy a three-legged racehorse. So what you do with these plaintiffs' rights ends up affecting the rights of the public in the adjacent properties elsewhere along Surfside Avenue. So I think the notion that you're going to, um, that you're not going to, to affect other, other rights and have unintended consequences, I, I don't think is accurate. In terms of not protecting private rights, um, the only provision in this settlement agreement that purports to protect private rights is an obligation by these five plaintiffs not to trigger the deadline provisions under the Paper Street Act. There's already been some commentary this evening about how you're attempting to use the wrong section to vacate the, public's, uh, the paper streets here, which I happen to agree with. But this settlement agreement does not preclude these plaintiffs or anybody else from taking other affirmative acts to diminish or to try to eliminate the private rights across Surfside Avenue. And it gets to be that much harder, obviously, if there are sections of Surfside Avenue that you are uh, vacating the private rights at, that, that end up making it impossible to exercise rights across the non-vacated portions here. Mr. Bryant, your time is up. Okay. Last thing I'd point out here is I would urge you to read the real estate acquisition and disposition policy, which clearly covers this piece of interest in real estate you're conveying. And it requires that this council uh, give notice Thank to the you. Conservation Commission. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Jan Corey. I'm a 17-year resident of 27 Trendy Road. Uh, this town is being held hostage by five very wealthy plaintiffs who have filed a lawsuit demanding that the town uh, he basically hand over to them some valuable shoreline property. You want this lawsuit to end, and that is very understandable. But what possible rationale do you have for accepting this proposed settlement other than to avoid litigation? Some of you appear to have been persuaded that you are exercising fiduciary responsibility by accepting this settlement. <laughs> But I believe you are exercising fiduciary irresponsibility. Through the precedent you will set, because this precedent will cost taxpayers down the road dearly, for you have opened the door to future litigation um, by a number of people who may simply, because of their wealth, decide that their personal interests really should be honored above those of the rest of the community. So by accepting this settlement, you're letting down the community you were elected to represent. We elected you to protect our interests. No one is really asking you to spend any money at all except for these five plaintiffs. None of us have asked you to spend one thin dime. You are in this position of exercising fiduciary responsibility because of the costs associated with the lawsuit brought by these plaintiffs. And from the start, their strategy has been to use their wealth and their commitments to get their way. You should not tell yourselves, as some attorneys have, that this is a compromise, because in a true compromise, compromise everybody gets something and everybody gives up something. The Shore Acres neighbors have only retained the rights they've had since 1911. The $500,000 the town uh, will receive cannot replace the far more valuable shoreline you will give up forever. Only the five wealthy plaintiffs will gain with this agreement, and their gain is the community's loss. And so I ask, why is this handful of people, why are their interests more important than the rest of the town? I was here one night when uh, former Councillor Ray asked everyone who was sitting um, at the town council table if they had any conflicts of interest. And I heard each and every one of the town councillors at that time say, nope, 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 nope. Yet among the community or within the community, many people feel that there are some possible um, conflicts of interest here. And it isn't so much that in a small community you don't know some of the, the abutters or the plaintiffs. That's understandable. 
The problem is that you fail to disclose what those relationships, whether they're personal or financial, are. Mrs. Corey, your time is up. Okay. Um, I will submit the rest of my remarks um, in writing to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, town councilors. Uh, my name is Tim Thompson. I live at Six Pine Ridge Road. I'm in the next neighborhood down Broad Cove Road. We had our own little battles with shorefront uh, rights uh, with our secret beach a few years ago. Cost the town, or cost uh, our neighborhood quite a bit. Cost the uh, owner of the property quite a bit. And ultimately, we ended up with a solution that's a, a metal gate that nobody pays any attention to anymore. And and uh, and. I think over a million dollars were spent in legal fees on that one, but uh, that was a compromise. Uh, I still think there's better. There's a better compromise that com could come out of this. Apparently, this a lot of this came to a, a head when uh, this particular waterfront uh, was identified as a potential uh, conservation trail or to add to our trail system. Uh, it seems like if we could assure these uh, five property owners that that wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, the town accept those streets, assure those five property owners that they're, we're not going to put this on a map and make it a popular site for thousands of people to walk. That might help them feel a little bit better. Uh, I, I, I'm very uh, conflicted on this because I have friends on both sides of this issue. I play golf with people on both sides of this issue. Uh, and those Saturday morning golf matches are going to be more difficult, I'm sure, one way or the other. The couple of points that I'd like to make is, um, one is the valuation of this. Um, you know, uh, if, if, and I'm, I'm against accepting their offer. Um, uh, I think it's, I, I'd, I'd like you to consider one thing. Um, what is the value of this? I've talked to a couple of counselors on this, and I don't think you've actually looked at any kind of a, of a professional approach to its value. So I'd at least like us to, so if we're gonna, if we're gonna consider uh, accepting this, I'd like to take a look at what the value is. I think Mary Ann Lynch submitted a letter that uh, uh, very well respected Ann Kayata had presented to this town council a couple years ago that established sheep through looking at uh, uh, budding properties and assessed values and it, it looked at this valuation at something in excess of $2 million and that was a couple years ago. So I'd like to ask that you back it up, slow it down and maybe take a look at what its actual value is before you accept 500,000. Try to find a compromise. Uh, I, I, I do feel for these people. I have walked that space. I mean, I've walked up through uh, Ledgewood Lane up through there and it's a beautiful area. Uh, I don't like the precedent that it sets. I, I think it sets us up for some problems with future Paper Street considerations, future trails. We've got trails all over this town. Uh, there's a trail that comes right down Broad Cove Road and goes uh, through uh, some uh, uh, RP1 area and comes out of Pine Ridge Road and people walk it all the time with dogs and, and uh, there isn't really an issue with that. How this has become an issue, I don't know, but a compromise still is possible and I'd ask you to take into consideration that. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who would like to address the council during this public hearing? Good evening. My name is Daniel Harriman. I live at 21 Kettle Cove Road. Um, my family settled here sometime around 1890. We fished here on the shore and had access to the water and, and different things. And actually, I can't. I know the area I played there. I'm sure I walked the trail. I've been along the shore and everybody's backyards as well as people coming through my backyard to get to the Crescent Beach before it was a state park. Um, I've seen a tremendous pressure on waterfront access. Just, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. I fish out of Portland and, and uh, the economic, Prosperity has put pressure there. It's put pressure on the Cape. I don't know if it, you know there's a lot of issues even in the Cape other than this issue, but I don't know law. 
I don't know the rules, but I know when precedents are set, that sometimes they're really cast in stone. This is just the way we go. We follow the precedent. We follow the trail of one before. So I really believe all of you are really saddled with a really tough decision. I mean, there's, um, there's fiscal responsibility to the town. There's um, responsibility for the best interests of all people of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm a taxpayer. My family's been paying taxes in this town for well over 130 years. And I'm willing to spend the money to stand up for what I believe is right. And that's really what I think. There's right and there's wrong. It's easy to find a gray area, and well, this is the best and fiscally responsible or whatever, but in my book, there's right and there's wrong. And I'm not going to impose my opinions on any of this. You all have to, at some point, decide what is right and what is wrong. And I think if you put fiscally responsible and a dollar amount on what makes it right, you can really lose the point of what is right and what is wrong. Some things money cannot buy. Money cannot change right to wrong, and it can't change wrong to right. And I, it's up to you, and I don't envy you at all, because all of you at some point is going to have to decide what is right and what is wrong. Or you'll leave it up to us. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Corey. I live at 27 Trundy Road with my lovely wife, Jan, um, who is a friend. And I'm also a friend of Tim Thompson. And I play golf with him. And he and I are pretty much on the same side of mo most things, politically and in this particular case. Um, I love numbers. I'm a former CPA. I think about big numbers all the time. And $500,000, by the way, in a stack of $1 bills would be 170, 185 feet tall. It would take five days, five and three quarter days, counting out $500,000 at $1 per second nonstop round the clock. We can avoid all of that by not accepting the $500,000. <laughs> but um, if we took it all in, I don't think if, if this were accepted and we accepted the money and we got, we got $1 bills, it would weigh 1,102 pounds, which I can't carry. And who wants to deposit that kind of money in the bank? <laughs> It was one year and four days ago, that's 369 days ago, that Penny Jordan made a comment on this issue and said, and, I, and I'm quoting here because being a new resident, I take notes when I come to the town council meetings. Penny, Penny Jordan made the comment the town council's obligation is to protect town assets. And I would maintain that the paper streets and shore access is a very, very large town asset that we should continue to protect. Thank you. Thank you. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Is there anyone else who would like to speak during the public hearing? If not, I will close the hearing. Anyone else at all? The public hearing is closed. Can we take a two minute break while everyone's...
Great idea. With the council's permission, would, would we like a up to five minute break? Okay, we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you, Council Strong.
all that. Okay. Item number 125, review of proposed settlement agreement relating to the Paper Street sections of Surfside Avenue. I'll just go ahead and read this item for the benefit of everyone listening. On August 13, 2018, the Town Council voted to send the proposed settlement agreement between the Town of Cape Elizabeth and Amai Khalidi, David Leopold, Kara Leopold, Andrew Summer, Susan Ross, Stuart Wooden, Julie Wooden, and Pilot Point LLC regarding Paper Street sections of Surfside Avenue to a public hearing to begin the deemed vacation process of a Paper Street section of Surfside Avenue. So we've, we've had our public hearing. We had discussed already as a council to not vote on this item this evening, to take the time to absorb the information and the comments that we've heard tonight. We have a 60-day stay. I think that's the legal term. So we do need to vote on this. Uh, on or before September 19, and in discussing with the town manager today, he has proposed September 19 for that vote. So I'd like to uh, open up uh, this item to comment from councilors, or perhaps I should uh, ask the town manager if he'd like to speak to it before we do that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, at this point in time, what the council does, the council does need to take action regarding formal action regarding the proposed settlement agreement. And again, that the most, uh, I guess you could say the closest date where there would be an opening would be the 19th and it coincidentally sets up as well within the 60 day window that we had, uh, that the town had to act on. So uh, we do have the room available and Deborah and I have made sure that uh, the schedule complies with that. So if, if the council so desires, we could schedule a meeting for, for that evening. Councilor Kentler, Jordan? I just wonder why we don't set a special council meeting for the 17th after our workshop when we're already all it, here. If, if I may, yeah. if I may uh, that evening the workshop has two items that are on there. Uh, first being the pay and display uh, discussion with the Fort Williams Park Committee. Uh, and the second is the Harbors Committee report. So the thought being that it may take, those are both been fairly well attended or well discussed concepts. I guess the thought was that you wouldn't want to hurry through either of any of the three items up for discussion. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly anticipating that with the Fort Williams um, reviewing the, the uh, proposed pay display parking research, uh, information and research, that we will have a lengthy discussion in that workshop on just that alone, not to mention the other items. So. So this was the thought, to set aside a special meeting where the only thing we have to focus on is the proposed settlement agreement, which I would anticipate we will have quite a, quite a lot of lengthy debate between the seven of us. Councilor Straw? The one thing that really struck me in this, and I apologize to the general public because it hadn't really I hadn't absorbed it until I heard it and I realized I was looking at this the wrong way. We just had a public hearing and I had been viewing it as an opportunity for us to hear from the public and get information from them and they're going to give us our, their opinions. And I, it's great to hear everyone's opinions, but the problem is I feel like we deprive them of the opportunity to have informed opinions. They have opinions, but they're uninformed. And the reason I think that is that I don't have an informed opinion at this point. I am not aware of any of the facts in this case. I don't know if it's just me, but for example, I have no idea what this asset is worth. I have no idea what facts support the plaintiff's positions here. I, there's nothing for me to make an informed decision on. So we can go ahead and we can set this motion. We we'd set this uh, the vote. We can take the vote, but. Unless the plaintiffs or someone else that knows this, or someone is willing to come in and place these facts before us in the general public, we've deprived the general public of an opportunity to make informed public comment on this issue because they don't know what the position is. As someone said, I, and I'll, I'll let you know, if I th all I'm looking for is fairness. I'm looking for an offer that is fair to the town. And if it's fair to the town, I'm going to take it. But I can't make that decision without some facts for me to decide if it's fair or not. 
as it stands, how am I supposed to accept this decision if, how am I supposed to accept this proposal if I don't have any facts to back it up? So that's my, my take. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Caitlin Jordan? I was gonna say, unfortunately you have the disadvantage of coming on to the council yep. this year. But I know Penny, when she came on to the council, she did a great deal of homework and has a ginormous folder of just about everything that deals with this issue. And so maybe if you ask nicely, she would let you borrow it because, I mean, there's so much history that goes with this. You are going to need between now and the 19th to read through it. But that's just the unfortunateness of your timing of coming on the council because all those questions that you're asking have all been answered. The information's out there. There's just a great deal of reading that needs to happen. Councillor Strong. Oh, so does that include an appraisal of the land? I, I, I believe at one point we have lots of numbers. We've heard lots of numbers from Matt. We've heard lots of numbers from, I, I just, I don't know if there's what, I can't give you an answer without looking right. at it. Councillor Randall. Um, I borrowed Penny's notebook and it was very helpful. Um, but I also jotted down that question. Um, what is the cost? What is the value? Um, I know that we have an estimate that was provided that was around two million. That's not really an official assessment of the value of the property. I'm curious to know that. Um, how much would these properties increase in value if they were to gain this extra land? Um, how much would it cost if the town were to purchase this strip of land? Those are questions I think that are legitimate people brought to the table today. Um, and questions that I also have. Those I, I jotted down the same ones because the dollar amounts haven't really been uh, documented. They've been Flowing. discussed, mm -hmm. thrown around, but I think we do need to have that information. Well, and the other, the other point that was brought up tonight is what happens to the property values of uh, the people in the Shoreika subdivision mm -hmm. um, and would their property values be diminished if this settlement was accepted? Because if, if, if they perceive that they no longer have the, the, the votes, I'm sorry, the votes, the, um, the rights of access or those access rights are in question, you know, what happens to their property values? And that's, that was brought up tonight too. And I thought, well, that's a very, very good question. Any, any other thoughts? Councilor Garvin? Um, I just wanted to, enumerate a couple of points uh, this is in all honesty offered without without commentary but just in the interest of trying to have clear facts out there um, a few points that were brought up by some of the speakers um, mr. Volts had asked for um, sort of along this line of questioning um, a lot of the details I, I agree with him that we haven't sort of packaged it up in a tidy chart or anything like that but um, the information about what these properties are currently assessed at is available on the assessor's database, which is available to anybody from the town to go on the town website. You could call our tax assessor, tax assessor Mr. Sweat, uh, and get those. Could we do a better job of, of presenting that information? I'm sure we could, and I think that's good feedback. Um, in terms of what the market value is, um, I, I think that's purely speculative. There's a number of good real estate um, professionals in town. We, uh, I'm sure, could engage a property assessor. Um, I have a lot of questions just about what the value of something that um, th there's, there's sort of no comp for, right? So I think that's a big speculative question that a lot of people might have a wide range of opinion on. Um, Mr. Um, Mawson had expressed dismay about the fact that the um, SOS coalition or anyone from SAIA was not represented in the mediations. Um, for anybody that's not clear, and I, I want to try and just clarify this point, the mediation was brought about as a function of the lawsuit, okay? So we, we as the council didn't say, well, let's just figure out if we can come to a nice agreement on this. It's, it's a matter of uh, superior court process that if you're engaged in litigation as a means of trying to, to divert course, court cases away from going through to full litigation, that you enter into mandated mediation. So the two parties to the lawsuit 
were the collective plaintiffs and the town uh, represented by the council. Um, so this, this wasn't something that was open for invitation uh, for other people to join at the table for. Um, you know, we held, a, a, as, as many people have referenced, a, a mediated and facilitated community discussion uh, to get people's opinions and to try and find areas of compromise and, and, and uh, sort of common interest. But as a matter of legal mediation, only the parties that are party to the lawsuit can participate in that. Um, Ms. Leonard brought up a point about um, the, the, the consideration of the agreement being based on false information, um, alluding to the Northeast Civil um, Survey that was, being, that was done. I just wanted to point out that there are a number of exhibits and a number of documents that we've looked at collectively as a council, as well as the, the three counselors and the town manager and the attorneys that were specifically at the mediation. Um, that have a wide variety of interpretation of the boundaries and things like that. Uh, to, to, to assume that any decision was made solely on that exhibit would be incorrect. Um, I am interested to explore further with the attorneys some points that have been brought up tonight by um, uh, both Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, as well as I think a couple of other, just to make sure that we're not doing something incorrect in reference to the statute. I think that's a very important um, question that's been raised. Um, I would, I would uh, just like to s sort of correct, the, the, uh, there was a statement made that the reason you extend is on the assumption of acceptance, and um, that may be one interpretation. Another is that um, you don't have full facts on something. There were a number of reasons we extended various paper streets that had nothing to do with shoreline access or a, paper tra uh, a potential walking trail. Um, that had to do with the need to preserve for some other reason a decision down the road, but it didn't assume acceptance. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, Ms. St. Louis had some questions on um, the lack of clarity on the property, of, uh, which properties and, and their location on the map. Um, again, I think this is a matter of material presentation, but we could certainly work with the planner to provide specific information about, um, about those. Um, and just the last thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, I wanted to go on the record as taking great offense at the comment that um, anything related to the financial matter here uh, could be in any way construed as some sort of payment for votes. I was greatly offended by that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask Derwood to come up to the podium. Uh, I think given that we have several counselors who are concerned about what the actual valuation of the property is um, and, you know, is $500,000 not enough? How would we go forward with that? We have a, a stay involved here. We have to make a decision by the 19th on this settlement proposal. But we've got, and we, you know, what was discussed in mediation is confidential, but how, how do we legally respond to the, the questions that have just come up from several counselors, as well as people that were you know, sure. speaking to us. I, th I think one option you might want to consider is to have an executive session mm -hmm. uh, the evening of the 19th, starting with an executive session. Uh, I think the value um, plays into um, not only what an appraiser might say, and it's, incidentally, it's a very difficult, complex appraisal topic when you're talking about a incipient right of a, of a trail is extremely complex from an appraisal point of view, but I'm not an appraiser. But then you have to also um, consider the risk of litigation risk on, t on top of the appraisal uh, in, in that sort of analysis. And that's the type of analysis you go through a lot in settling litigation, where you're looking at a number of replacement costs of a building, it could be uh, a replacement cost of uh, medical bills, um, it could be any number of, of forms of damages in, in a civil case, uh, and this is a civil case. And I think that really is a, a discussion that one of your options would be an executive session. I do recommend that. All right. And what are counselors thinking about that? Plan to have an executive session before a special meeting on the 19th in order to explore with our attorney some of these questions. Councilor Randall? I think that doesn't necessarily address the issue of getting this information to the public because it would be so close in time to our vote on it. 
I don't know if it's possible for us to have an executive session even a few days before um, maybe the evening of our workshop or something like that, but I wouldn't be comfortable with that plan. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. I said a question again about the 19th. Is everybody else available on the 19th? Is Sarah available? I mean, I'm not. So I'm just curious, like, when we decided on the 19th and when we were going to get notice about it, I just assumed, I guess, when we discussed it earlier that we were going to have it on the 17th because we already had a meeting scheduled. Otherwise, we would have, I mean, Penny, Valerie, and I just spent the whole break trying to book a meeting for the Jordan Trust, and that was difficult. I'm just, such a very big topic. I'm just a little disappointed in the process of how we're going about picking what night to have it on. Uh, well, there, a decision hadn't been made, but I know the town manager and uh, mentioned it to me to look at that date because we were already pretty full for Monday the 17th. I don't know if you wanted to add to that. That's that summarized yeah. yeah. as much as I can do. Yeah. Madam Chair. Uh, yes. So, how's this so I understand that it's been phrased that we need to decide by the 60 days, but mm -hmm. I think that isn't probably correct. I think it would be good if we decided by the 60 days. Would that be? Councilor Straw, I think we could speak with the, the council about extending that uh, for a brief period of time. I don't have, I haven't had that discussion with them. It, it, and so, to the extent that we went past that 60 days, it would just mean that we'd have to file papers in response to some motion or something. What would the, be the implications? Well, we have worked informally with council to get an extension of, of time uh, to file our opposition to the summary judgment, which is. More than some papers, it's a, uh, it's a enough, very in-depth uh, process, and, yeah. and we would want to postpone that if you could until you um, decided up or down on this. Um, and I'm reasonably confident we could probably buy some more time, but probably not a lot more time. So, what do we? Are we going to decide on meeting first, or? Well, I yeah. I well, I I, I think we. I think we would need to decide, or I'd like us to decide, first of all, in an executive session that we probably should have for several reasons before we actually have our, our meeting to vote. I'm not sure how we would uh, solve the question of, of Councilor Randall's concern of, of valuation for public, how we come to a valuation for public benefit. Is that, am I phrasing that correctly? Uh, Sort of. <laughs> Sorry. You, you want you, to have any professional you, opinions you, in hand you want by a prof next week. You want a professional, <laughs> essentially, a pr opinion of the value of the property before we vote, and that's something that we can discuss with the town as to how we reach this amount. Is that, that what I'm hearing? To clarify, I'm not asking anyone to assess the value of the town's incipient rights. Mm -hmm. I'm asking. I have two questions. One is. Can we get an estimate of how much those properties would increase in value okay. if the town were to vacate those portions of the paper streets? And the second question that I think is important is if, in a different scenario, the town were to purchase an easement over that strip of land, what would that cost be, roughly, to two professional opinions? Uh, okay, let me just ask the town manager to speak. If I may, through the chair, uh, to Councilor Randall's question, part A, is obtainable um, if you were strictly looking at assessed value, which is where the town, in this case, the question could be answered. So you could look at what the assessed value would have been uh, without the vacation and what the assessed value of the, of the identified properties would be with the vacation. Um, part two is significantly more difficult. Um, as a reformed real estate appraiser for 25 <laughs> years, uh, I would look at this and say uh, it's all about comparables. And as, as Attorney Parkinson had said, in this case it's a civil matter, so there are a lot of different values that you could, that you could be placing into there. As far as determining what the value of the incipient rights would have been if you, if you walked away from it, um, I think you know, probably through the mediation process, you may have explored and determined what the actual value would be, where you have two parties who are on opposite ends, and they've come to 
agreement as to what that value would be in exchange. Uh, whereas you have both parties that are equally motivated to find an agreement and they've arrived at a, at a value. They may have started at completely different ends of the spectrum, but when they finally met in the middle, is that's kind of the, the, the bottom line determination of what value means. Um, there are, it would, if you wanted to go out and find an appraiser to do that, uh, they would probably have to scour a significant portion of the country to find, if you could find anything that would have the similar comparables. You could have some levity, or some, sorry, some, not levity, some, levity, levity. Choice. <laughs> some, some, some uh, variety as far as what you would find for, for comparable sales and have to make those adjustments that would exist to, to try to identify the differences, but they would be similarly arbitrary as far as trying to determine where you, where you want to be. So uh, that's a long story short to saying, uh, I'm not sure if there's a person out there who could find, really determine what that value would be uh, above and beyond what, what you've already done. And then coming back to the $2 million number that was thrown out earlier, that was looking at all 10 properties through, uh, through Ms. Swift Cata's uh, analysis that was done last year. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of ways to extract that value as well. Uh, but it's, it's really difficult to end up really coming up with a quantifiable number that you could hang on that and you could come forward and show, show people. Whereas you could look at this and say, three counselors and their attorneys and the town manager met with parties from the other side and they arrived at this agreement and that's what's on the table for discussion at this point in time. To go back and try to change the number as well, you're looking at completely voiding the agreement as, as it is as well. So there's a lot of additional dominoes in play. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but that's, that's kind of where you're at. Well, I've, I've got a question, <laughs> Councilor Randall. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, are you asking that, that if this was all, had all been private property from the beginning and there had never been a paper street, right. and the town of Cape Elizabeth said, gee, we'd like to purchase an easement for a walking path along the Santaya Strip, is that what you're asking? That is exactly what okay. I'm asking. Okay. In a different world, different scenario, what can we get cost? a number? What I, I can imagine we've yeah. purchased other easements in this town. There must be something similar. We can at least get some ballpark numbers about what it would cost. Well, you know, we could certainly try. We could, we could see if the town planner can come up with anything. I mean, she certainly is our guru on Paper Street, um, Greenbelt Trails and all that. But yeah, I mean, I certainly don't recall that, I mean, I've been on the council long enough, we've certainly approached landowners for easements here and there. I, I don't recall that we've done this on oceanfront property, but, but it would be, a, at the very least, an interesting financial exercise to see mm -hmm. should, what would it cost if we ever tried to do that, you know, and thinking in terms of what is the value of what we're giving up or selling, if that, you know, and how to compare those. I mean, that would be one, one way to look at it or whatever. So that's what I was just gonna ask you. I think- Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Uh -huh. To clarify, I'm not terribly concerned about the numbers here. <laughs> and I know, I think I've made my position clear that to me this is more about principle, but I think it's an issue that's important to a lot of residents. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna make sure that they have that information and that other counselors have that information. Well, I, I think we could certainly ask our, our town planner to perhaps look at easements that we have purchased on pieces of land. How we would compare them to a property like this, I don't know, but we can certainly try, I would think. Uh, Councilor Straw had something. I think Councilor Randall has basically said it all so well. Uh, she, she succinctly did it. Um, and that's, those are the numbers I'm looking at. Um, I was just gonna make a comment. There's this concept called ZOPA, zone of possible agreement. And if you have us on one side, we have a zone we're willing to agree to. They're on the other side, they have a zone they're willing to agree to. You can reach an agreement if there's that overlap. But when there is that overlap, then it turns into um, how much of the overlap do we get? How much do they get? And I, I'm concerned if there is an overlap. First off, it's not even clear if there is an overlap, but if there is, I want to make sure that the town gets its fair share of that overlap. So that, that's the point. And this quote's been stuck in my head, and I've gone back and forth on whether I'm going to say it for so long, um, and I'm just going to say it. So I can't check my knowledge at the door with this case. 
I'm no one's attorney. This isn't legal advice in any way, shape, or form. I've known about this quote since before I was on the town council. It's just sitting here in my head. And every time this case comes up, all it does is it runs through my head. It takes about two minutes to look it up. And it's, let a public way once constructed be free for the public use and control as it may choose. Let it be free as the ocean is free, as free as our rivers are free, and as our ponds and great lakes are free for the use of all people. And I have that stuck in my head. So to Councillor Randall's point about, it's more about principle. I have that quote and it's stuck there. So yes, the numbers do come into play for me, but it's also gonna have to get past that quote. So that's it. Uh, Matt, I just want to ask you, I, I lost you on overlap. What, what were you... When you're negotiating a settlement or any issue with someone, so let's say um, I'm going to give up something that's worth $10 to me. So I'm not going to give it up unless I get at least $10. The other side, it's worth um, to them um, $100. So they're willing to pay me up to $100 to get it. I'm not willing to take less than 10. That difference between 110, that's the zone of possible agreement, okay. and it's all about do we get our fair share of that. Okay, thanks. And by the way, that quote was an SJC opinion. Okay. Not legal advice. Well, let's get back to um, scheduling an executive session, scheduling a meeting. I think that, um, you know, we, we had plan to not vote on this issue tonight. That was something we were all aware of. Um, and and um, so let's get back to the 19th. Um, are people available on the 19th? Will they make themselves available? I, I initially, Jordan? I initially um, actually I have a meeting that is a standard meeting uh, on the 19th, but I think this issue uh, is important enough that I would um, try to either shift that or just not attend it. Thank you. Caitlin? <coughs> I have that same meeting and something else on top of that. So it's just a lot of, I was already <coughs> deprioritizing. Yeah. But I'm just curious, like, how, like, you know, is Sarah, and you know, if she's away, is she going to be back? I mean, I just don't want to be juggling everybody's schedule if everybody's juggling their schedule. This just doesn't seem... I'm sorry. I don't think so. No. I, yeah. Sorry. If, if I may, yeah. I, I believe yeah. Council Lennon will be, will be oh, back. Oh, I know she'll be available. back. Yeah. I'm saying whether or not she's... A, I'm, I, I just... I left our last meeting, I guess my fault, assuming that when we discussed postponing the vote a week, we were literally postponing the vote a week and having it on the 17th, because that's, so I just oh, like, okay. we, you know, we're busy. We schedule lots of things and trying to schedule something nine days out, it's just, I just missed that, I guess. Okay. It would have been nice to know. Well, it sounds like uh, we have a green light from the council, so what we will do is go ahead and plan for an executive session. Uh, I think an hour in advance. Was that uh, I, 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 September 19? Would that be possible? Yes. Okay. Um, we would have, we could schedule our executive session for 6 o'clock. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. here, and then proceed with our meeting at 7, our special meeting on, on voting on this. What, so. what are we having the executive session on now, if it's just getting these numbers that it's not going to be drawn up by Derwood? Well, I, I think there are some other concerns. Oh, I just, that's what I'm yeah. curious. Like, I think there are, there are some other concerns and probably I would not be at liberty to really dive into those, but I was just. I was just curious, yeah. just the mention of an executive session only came up with the request of the numbers. So I was just, if the numbers weren't even going to be coming from him, but coming from best guesses mm -hmm. by what we can come up with. I just, yeah. Okay. No, what I was hearing that there was a number of legal questions, and the and the um, numbers play into that. You know, to what extent the numbers relate to the current legal situation we're in. And I thought it was most appropriate to discuss that in, in executive mm -hmm. session. So, um, but um, I'm, I'm 
and, and we're available the 19th if, if that is convenient for okay. all of you, and that's your decision, obviously. Well, I say let's plan it. <laughs> the attorney's available. Yeah, right. Councilor Penny Jordan, you're squinting. Well, that's because I, I, I thought Valerie had on the table that the executive session be like the 17th, and then we do our oh, special okay. meeting on the 19th. And her logic, I thought, was pretty good that, you know, that we get the numbers, we uh, ha have questions. It gives us a little bit more time to, this is an important decision. It's not a bing, bang, boom. And uh, that's just the way I feel. Well, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I temporarily forgot that she suggested the <laughs> 17th. That's the only reason. Are you available on the 17th? Yes. Okay. Make it like we have no, no other engagements, but <laughs> too easy. But we're both yeah. the 17th and the 19th. Yes. Okay. Um, at 6 p.m.? On, on the, the 17th? 17th? Yes. Okay. And so, yeah, thank you. Penny. One more thing to that. Can we get those numbers to him by this week so he can actually advise us on Monday the 17th? Okay. If, yeah. if I may, uh, yes, I, I believe we can get at least everything that we have physically available. I will, we will endeavor ourselves to provide. Uh, you know, I'll work with Clinton tomorrow morning. Uh, to work on getting part A and then part B, we will scour our records to see where there is evidence of easements that were purchased within the town, at least as something as a starting point to get the numbers that we have. They, okay. they, may wild, they may vary wildly, but we will get everything that we have available. So I've got some thoughts on that and I'll work with Maureen to, to work on that as well. I don't know where this fits, but I have to say it so that um one of the things that's imperative for me relative to this agreement is the, um, the residents in, uh, in Shore Acres. And I, I, I read the, uh, the, the elements of the agreement and I hear Durwood say we did the best, we, we have made it as tight as we can and um, but I have a little bit of angst about where, whether something can happen in the future that would impact the, uh, the explicit and implied rights of the, the, the citizens in, in uh, Shore Acres. And so as we go through this process over the next uh, several days into next week, I really need to figure out is there a way to have some assurances because I recognize as Jamie said the the whole mediation between town and um, and the people who start who who submitted the lawsuit but my whole thing has always been that we need to recognize what's going on in the neighborhood and the rights of the people who live there. And so I somehow need to, through this process, get to the point where I'm comfortable that those are protected in some way for uh, perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how we'll get there, but uh, um, I think that we need to figure out how that happens. Mm -hmm. Councilor Straw? I agree with Councilor Jordan, um, and I'm sure you're all gonna say no to this, but. For the time being, I move we table this issue for the time being. And I'd appreciate a second. We have a so second. We are tabling. So, I mean, Penny Jordan has a second, and I think, I can't remember parliamentary can't procedure talk. on table. I think that's it. That's it. Okay, that's can, it. Can I, just, uh, well, not, I don't know. Just a procedural question. Okay. Can you have somebody explain exactly what a vote to table that would do to this discussion right now. Maybe that would be just well advised before we vote so that you fully understand what you just did. Good point. That, that's a very good point. And uh, this is one of the very few nights that I don't have my Robert's Rules. <laughs> uh, I have left today. <laughs> It doesn't travel with me. I was going to say, <laughs> luckily, 
<laughs> Matt just pointed out we do have our attorney. Amateur Robert's Rules of Order, you can table to a date certain or you can table indefinitely. Um, assuming the board has adopted Robert's Rules, if it hasn't, okay. that's a standard um, sort of go-to general. But you got to be specific. Are you tabling it generally? Are you tabling it to a, a date certain? Um, okay, thank you. And so to uh, oh, withdraw like and then remake it. Um, so uh, I'd like to withdraw my motion, then I'll remake it. I move that we table indefinitely. Is there a second to do that? There is not. There we go. So the motion fails. All right. Could I have a motion then to uh, go into an executive session on six, at 6 p.m. on September the 17th for the purpose of obtaining further legal advice on the settlement, proposed settlement on, on Surfside Avenue? And. Uh, at seven, seven on the 19th. And I'm sorry, what? On town council at 7 p.m. Yes, and uh, if I could also add to that same motion that we have, we hold a special meeting on Wednesday. Is it a Wednesday? Yes. yes. Wednesday, yeah. September 19th at 7 p.m. to vote on the proposed settlement. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any more discussion? So That's I guess this still raises the issue, and this is why I said indefinitely, because I assume we'd then take it off once we figure this out, because it sounds like we still haven't figured this out. Councilor Randall's point that we still haven't given the public really an opportunity other than, ha ha, here you go, on the, the night that we vote. Um, and that's, I guess, what I'm looking to, uh, how, how, do we, how do we address that? So okay. I want to know how this deals with that. Thank you, Councilor Randall. Um, question for Councillor Straw. Yep. By tabling indefinitely, were you looking to have potentially another public hearing? I think, um, yes. I, I don't know what we're going to get. That's the thing is, I don't know if we're going to have something that will be of use to anyone or if it's going to be, we, did, we just don't have anything. I don't know. So I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Councillor, uh, was Caitlin next? She was yeah. I was going to say, if we have to vote by September 19th or ask for an extension that they may so graciously give us, if we table it indefinitely, you're basically rejecting the agreement right now, done, because we won't have a date to when to pick it up. So it just, tabling it indefinitely at this point rejects the settlement agreement because we lose the opportunity to act on the settlement agreement before our deadline. And we won't have another meeting to what, discuss when we would take it off the table before the deadline. So I'm just saying we don't want to table it indefinitely, but I feel like if we're going to have an executive session on the 17th, then we can do our darndest to tell everybody that what information we can share will be posted bright and early on the 18th, and then our meeting will be on the 19th. I'm sure everybody who has a vested interest in this topic will be crashing our website on the 18th if that's what's going to happen. Uh, Councilor Garvin? I just want to make a point of parliamentary procedure that you actually weren't able to make a motion to table because there was no question actually pending. Oh. So <laughs> you have to have a pending question to be tabled. So as we were Got just it. in basically open discussion, there was nothing to table. Got it. I mean, you know, I one thought I just had is, let's just say we, we kind of find the numbers we want um, that we're looking for, and we have our special meeting. This is going to be, I think, a very long meeting. I think we're going to have a lot of debate. You know, uh, I think those, the values, the numbers that we receive, we'll be discussing. I mean, I understand what you're saying, Councilor Straw, I really do, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, this, this issue has been before us for a long time. And I don't, I mean, I, th I think there are lots of things that, you know, certainly could tie us up. And I'm, I'm not sure that they would be reasonable. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm on record as not in favoring the proposal. Um, of course, everyone knows that. But uh, I think that 
you know, we, we do need to move the process along. And so I think we'll have, we'll get the information. I think we'll do the best we can that we're looking for. Talk about it in an executive session and then in our special meeting. You know, we can certainly put something up on the website if, if that ends up being appropriate. Right. We're not sure, but if we can. And then by the time we have our meeting, um, you know, our, our citizens will be tuned in, I'm sure. It, this is probably then a question for Dillwood, just to clarify. I don't think we're allowed to debate the, in, I don't know. Are we, uh, so I guess, are we allowed to debate should, this in executive session? Del deliberating. Yeah. I, what I was gathering from yeah. the discussion is that you had a lot of questions and theories and cases and Got things that you wanted to discuss with me. That's the purpose of an executive Got session, it. not Got a backdoor way of deciding something and right. coming out. And that's, you know, obviously very poor for, um, you know, public confidence in the system yep. that you would, you know, not that you would do it, you, but I've seen boards that come back out of executive session and boom, and of course you know that they basically decided. Um, but what I was uh, talking about is the number of questions that were raised and people were keeping track of those. That would be a good thing to discuss in executive session. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Any, any more thoughts from counselors? All right. So we have a motion. We have a motion on the table, mm -hmm. and it was seconded. Mm -hmm. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next item, number one twenty. <laughs> one twenty. I'm sorry, Councilor Garvin. I move that we suspend. I move that we suspend our rules for the interest in proceeding on new business following our ten o'clock curfew. Ah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, oh, second. Is there a second? Thank you. Any discussion? Thank you. <coughs> All those in favor of continuing to finish? It's unanimous. Thank you, Councilor Garvin. Yep. Item number one. Uh, is there anyone that would like to speak to this item? Uh, before we start deliberating on, on general assistance. Seeing no one, uh, it is recommended that the town council set to public hearing general assistance ordinance appendix A through D as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association effective October 1, 2018 to September 30, 2019. I would like to ask the town manager to just mention this. We, we, do, go through, we do vote on this yearly. Um, but I'll, I'll just ask him to just tell, tell us a little more about it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, this is a, an annual occurrence, as you accurately stated, that uh, always comes about this time of year when the, we do receive the updates to uh, the general assistance ordinances. Uh, it's generally these these appendices each each time, and they specifically, I think, relate to, uh, among many things, uh, the ability to qualify for general assistance, among other among other items. So. Uh, the way to adopt these changes is to go through the public hearing process and then uh, adopt them shortly thereafter. It's generally uh, pro, pro forma. All right. Any questions, thoughts? Is there a motion to set to public hearing on Wednesday, October 10, 2018 at 7 p.m. The tape at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall, the General Assistance Ordinance Appendix A through D, as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association, effective October 1, 2018, to September 30, 2019. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Councilor Penny Jordan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 127, the Senior Property Tax Relief Program. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this item? I don't see anyone, so we'll move along. Uh, we did have our presentation by Clinton Sweat uh, at the beginning of our meeting tonight. Thank you again. And he had presented this to us last year, I think it was. I'm trying to remember. I don't know. It was back was in it the, last back year or early in the year? In oh, that's right. Yeah. You mentioned it. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, uh, uh, is there a motion to adopt? No, wait a minute. We're just going to refer to Ordinance Committee. I'm sorry. Do it at a late hour. I'm getting a little. Um, yeah. Is there a motion to send to the ordinance committee for review and recommendation the proposed senior property tax relief program? Councilor Garvin. So moved. Is there second. a second? Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Any discussion? Just one thing. Yes. I know I've asked this before, but it would have been really nice to Mr. Swift if this could have been like the first thing on the agenda, because 
It was least. quick. <laughs> if I, if yeah, I may, well, let, let me ask <laughs> Matt to address that. If, if I may, Councilor Jordan, uh, I had advised uh, Assessor Mr. Sweat that he was free to live free oh. to leave after his presentation, but he really enjoys these public hearings. Okay, I'm just saying, like, you know, it's 10 o'clock, like, right. before... Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I, that's, that's why I had him at the beginning of the agenda and uh, said, You're, you'll be free to go after that, but he's just, he's that guy. All right. So, <laughs> thanks, okay. So, uh, any, yes, I just have a question when the next ordinance meeting is. We have to schedule it. We'll have to schedule it. Are, okay. are we, uh, can I follow up? Uh, yep. yep. It, it's part of what Clint had detailed. It, it was somewhat laying out a timeline for getting this right. in motion. Oh, do, we, do we feel like that's yeah. achievable? Okay, yeah. thanks. If, 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 yeah. if, uh, if we had spoken probably in year one, uh, back during the budget process to through the adoption process, year one would probably be a, a little bit later than it would normally be. Uh, but then it would cut, revert back to the yep. calendar set up for year two and, and years subsequent. Thank you. Okay. Any more discussion? We have a motion and seconded. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. This, the senior property tax proposal will go on to the ordinance committee. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Clint. Uh, okay, item number 128, fund transfer approval for fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019. Uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? Seeing no one, I will ask the town manager to uh, tell us a little more about this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, during the process of the, uh, of the audit, I guess the the, the short way to put it. Um, I had conversations with Jen Connors, who is one of our auditors, uh, and she had recommended that we, the council would make a, the formal transfer or formalize the transfer of funds from these accounts that were identified during the budget process and had been in the document, but they were not on the, uh, on the documents that we had within, I guess, for lack of a better term, the big spreadsheet that we had within the body of the council uh, orders. So in order to make those uh, jive with what was intended, we needed to come back and make uh, an adjustment uh, so she could close out part of the, that part of the audit. And we had it for, for the two years uh, that we had the last uh, two years ago in this current year. And uh, what I'll do going forward is I'll summarize it in a better way to have it on the spreadsheet going forward. But it was a small difference that we needed to adjust. Um, and the other item that I did have, uh, going back and doing my research on this, I carried, uh, you'll see on page or let's see, under 127, it said on, for 2018, it had it under carry forward balances that actually should have been unassigned fund balance transfer that needed to take place for that for that year as well. So we just say that again, please. Um, on where, I guess it's on your second page, it yep. says carry forward balances. Yep. It actually should be an unassigned, unassigned fund balance transfer. Okay. And I went back through multiple uh, earlier budgets just to make sure that that had and it was a question of just uh, using the proper terminology. Okay. Okay. And the, there, there, there is no, you know, no change in taxation or anything along those lines. Just making officially getting an authorization from the council to make those fund trans transfer balances happen. All right. Is there a motion to approve the identified fund transfers listed below for fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019? in accordance with the town auditor's recommendation. So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Councilor Penny Jordan, is there any more discussion or any? If, if I may, yeah. could, could the record show that the, instead of it saying carried forward that it said unassigned fund balance? It just, uh, it's, uh, I don't yeah. wanna have to have this conversation okay. twice. So I apologize for the oversight. You have that. Yeah, okay, yep. Okay, town clerk has that. Thank you. Yep, any discussion? on that? All right. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to address the council on an item that is not on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Caitlin Jordan, and a second? Second. Councilor Randall. All those in favor? 
We are adjourned. Thank you.